blue button. Hello and welcome everybody. It's Monday night, 10 o'clock, so you know what time it is. Time for the show. Tonight I'm joined by Sean, and we are going to be talking about the development of the aircraft carrier to 1945. So, Sean, how's it going, man? Uh, you know, it's um, uh, tours are uh, completely dead right now. I've never seen it this dead before. I mean, it's really bad, you know? Um, so, you know, you got that going on, and uh, good news is the weather's not so bad. Now, it's kind of rainy, which somewhat hurts tours, but it also means that things are not as hot here, although there was a, when I was walking home from the tour, there was a bit of a heat spike, and that kind of got to me. You know, uh, but yeah, I took a walk outside before this, and it was feeling really good out there, like more like September, or early October. You know, which uh, is quite a shocker for uh, this time of year. <laughs> yeah, speaking of how the heat can kick your ass, uh, yesterday I decided to scope out campus because right now I'm staying in a hotel until my uh, permanent residence comes available, and so I decided to ride my bike. Well, one, this town is definitely not bike friendly. So it's a pretty oh, dangerous yeah. route. And in two, uh, I could the route's not that hard. I could do it physically. The problem is that I can't do it without becoming, you know, encased in my own sweat. So Damn. Yeah, you know, I can't go there I can't go to class and lecture dripping with sweat, so I guess I cannot ride my bike to class, which sucks. Because that was the plan. I and guess. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to transport my bike to Georgia. And now I'm not really going to be able to use it for the purpose I envisioned, so... Well, maybe great. eventually, right? Uh, no, because when I get my permanent address, that will be a greater distance, so... Oh. So even as so the weather will... cools down, it just will not be a practical trip then because of distance and danger. But anyway. How long are you, uh, you going to be at the uh, current place? I will be in Kennesaw for about nine months. I'll be going back in late May, unless I renew for another year. So I'll be here for okay. a bit. Gotcha. All right, man. Uh, do you want to talk about anything uh, while we're uh, waiting for things to rev up? You want to talk about anything that's uh, happening around the world right now? Um, Not especially, although I, I did want to mention that I have been to the Kennesaw battlefield and I took the time to read a book about the Atlanta campaign so I'd like to do a quick aside about that yeah we can even do a video on the Atlanta campaign sometime yeah um, well anyway uh, I just <laughs> I read a book by Stephen Davis and it's part one of two for his emerging Civil War series and the basic thesis of the work is that Joe Johnston really sucks as a general, at yeah. least that's heavily implied throughout the entire work. And he goes out of his way to say, in Dalton, Georgia, they have a statue of this man. They really shouldn't. Uh, and he talks about his pattern of his defense being retreat to the enemy's objective, then launch furious, desperate counterattacks and hope for the best. And it's really hard to refute that, just looking at the evidence, because there were all kinds of places he could have defended more... Uh, vigorously in North Georgia. The terrain here is fairly tough. I really don't know what Johnston was thinking. Um, it's inexplicable. I guess his positive reputation is because he, and Davis isn't going to this, but I'm guessing it's because Johnston must have had the qualities that people valued in that period, and he just kind of looked and seemed like what a soldier should be. So people assumed he was way more competent than he actually was. I mean, what do you think mm. about that? Uh, I think there's some truth to that. It should be kept in mind that Johnston had a very good antebellum career. Uh, noted marksman. Uh, he was actually a colonel during the Mexican-American War. You know, so... And it was a well, it was a staff rank, but he was ranked a general right before the Civil War. So high things were expected of Johnston. I mean, he did have the bearing as well, like you're saying. Uh, two things that are worth, I think, interesting about him is he did, when resigning the army, cry profusely and he never really had faith in the confederate cause uh joe joseph johnson really isn't truly is a man who's just following his state into oblivion and um 
you know, unlike guys like Beauregard and Lee, who really did believe that that in the Confederacy was going to win, you know. Um, but anyway, the other one too is fun fact: Joseph E. Johnston during the Civil War wore his, I think, his father and grandfather's Revolutionary War sword on his side because it's they had been an officer oh, in cool. uh, Washington's army. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> So I do think um, I do think you're right that he he gave that off, but I I don't think they were wrong to give him a high rank and give him a chance. I mean, most people thought well of Johnston and believed that he was going to be the real deal. You know, <laughs> little did they know, right? <laughs> yeah, little did they know that uh, they would dominate the memory of that for a long time, uh, which, is, which is pretty interesting given the actual details of the campaign that. I guess so many subsequent historians just know he had that high reputation, so they're reading into his campaign. Oh yeah, well this is clearly he must have needed to withdraw because otherwise he wouldn't because he's Joe Johnston. So he must it, have known what he was doing. Johnston, it also helped that Johnston gets involved in the feud with um, Jefferson Davis, so people who didn't like Davis would latch on to Johnston, of course. Yeah, because everybody's always on the side with the general over the politician usually. A lot of times, yeah. It, I mean, although not everybody. I mean, you know, Davis definitely had his uh, defenders. Uh, the other one too is that Johnston gets to write his memoirs. That's always a good thing. And Grant and Sherman had a ridiculously high opinion of Joseph e. Johnston. Like Grant said that Johnston was the Confederacy's best general. Well, that's and, a claim. Yeah, I, I, I think it's only because they were friendly. I mean, it's 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 total bunk. You know, my joke is that it's because Johnston let them do what they wanted to do. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, there's something to that, and also if you if you build him up, then it makes your victories more impressive. Yeah. So you got a lot of incentive yeah. to talk about how good your opponents were. You know, but saying that though, it should be kept in mind that you know, Grant was pretty negative about Albert Sidney Johnston, uh, Pemberton in particular. In the case of Albert Sidney Johnston, he straight up said he's like nothing he did showed that he had any capabilities as a commander to me. Um, he was a little more positive about Beauregard, but he didn't have too much to say. Right. Um, Lee, on the other hand, uh, he really downplayed Lee's abilities. And essentially, like, I think it, one of his con one of his things was like, yeah, Lee was successful because he had the support of the government and was popular. And he's like, believe me, that's more important than you'd, you'd know. And I'm like, yeah, you would know. You had the full support of, of Lincoln and Stanton. You know, they gave you more support than they gave anybody else. Um, so, hmm. you know, I just, it's, <clears throat> you know, Joseph E. Johnson just, he benefited from a lot of things that were going to help him have a uh, much more elevated reputation. Fun thing about Davis, though, the guy who wrote that book, uh, he's the head of the Emerging Civil War blogs book reviews. So he, he mails me books every once in a while to review, one of which they just posted a review of a uh, really awful biography of, um, of uh, Benjamin Butler. Oh man, that was not proud. Oh, it's awful. It's one of the worst Civil War books I've ever read. But they're going I, I to go ahead with it. No, it's no, 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 rev, no. Like reviewed, the book's published. It's oh, okay. It's a disgrace. It's, it's it's a disgrace. The the scholarship is awful. Uh, it's poorly written. Uh, it's very laudatory towards Butler, which I can understand, but it makes him very boring. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Love or hate Butler, he's not dull, and you've made this man dull. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this man's face was put at the bottom of a chamber pot. He must have done something interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't piss people yeah, you don't exactly. piss people off to that extent unless you did something worth note. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about my, maybe a Reed Davis's Atlanta will fall. Which is just an expansion of his emerging Civil War argument. You know? Yeah. Which is in two volumes. A long and bloody task, and then they have the other one, which I should probably check out. Yeah, I think the one I read yeah. was a long and bloody task, and then the, I need to go get the follow-up. I, I know they sell it at the battlefield. I'll probably have to go back maybe next weekend so All I can finish fighting, it. That one is called All the Fighting They Want. Um, yeah. I mean, am I correct in assuming that he seems to think that uh, Hood was actually an upgrade from Johnston? I think so. I don't know his exact feelings on Hood. 
Davis has apparently written a book. It hasn't been published yet, but he, uh, I, I've, but he has published a book on uh, Hood's Tennessee campaign. Um, I don't know. I kind of think Hood and Johnston, like, they just suck equally, but in different ways. Yeah, so lateral just, move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So a guy who won't <laughs> fight when he's got the advantage to a guy who doesn't know what an advantage is, but is willing to fight no matter what. Yeah, I think the worst thing about Hood, and even Hood's defenders will, will agree, that Hood's staff work was abysmal. You know, just abysmal. And apparently Lee, when they when Davis asked him, what do you think about putting Hood in charge? I know the man will fight. As to his other qualities, I'm going to have to plead the fifth or something to that effect. So, I mean, you know, given the standards of the day and how Lee was not one of the dog people, that was basically a fuck no. Yeah, a rather polite one. Um, Lee did say something like, uh, it's saying the equivalent of Hood is a capable and bold fighter. Has to other qualities I do not know. That, yeah. One has, keep, one has to keep in mind, too, Lee had only seen Hood as a brigade and division commander, you know, where... Uh, and, yeah, I mean, division command, I mean, that, that requires a lot of coordination as well, and Hood did fine in that capacity. But, you know, once they put him as a corps commander in Atlanta, I mean, you read the book. He didn't seem to come out too well, did he? No, he, he did pretty poorly at corps. Um, and partly, I think, from what I remember, uh, when he got deployed... And launched attacks. He was never supported by other units. I mean, he kind of just did his own thing. Yeah, but coordination overall, uh, coordination between corps and the Civil War is really difficult. Yeah, although he also uh, fucked up in one battle where um, one of his divisions ran into unexpected difficulties, called off the attack. He agreed to call off the whole attack, but his other two divisions went ahead anyway, and one of them got mauled pretty bad. I can't remember the name of the engagement, yeah. but. I want to say that's Kolb's farm. Yeah. Which is pretty bad. Um, you know, but... Yeah, you know, the Atlanta campaign might be... Um, might be a good one. And then you do the sequel of the Carolinas campaign. You mentioned uh, Thoughtful Pug one to do. Yeah. Yeah, we'll uh, look in more into the Carolinas campaign. That's one I find interesting. It's a little neglected because, of course, by that point, the war was over. But there's still some interesting stuff, such as the uh, Union attack on Fort Fisher with the... Uh, you know, fatal sound wave. Um, yeah. And also some of the fighting around Fort Anderson and Fisher was interesting. Um, I remember we talked about General Terry one time, and that was all I knew about him, is that he had been the general who landed there and then linked up with Sherman. Uh, yeah, it, I think the Carolinas campaign also gets forgotten because, I mean, the Petersburg one isn't at this time. In fact, if anything... If anything, the phase of the Petersburg campaign that is has the most written about it is the final phase, both the storming of Lee's lines and then the um, uh, Appomattox, you know, the pursuit to Appomattox. Uh, but of course, that's important because all the drama with it, you know, the two most famous generals, and it effectively ends the war at that point. Uh, Hood's Atlanta campaign is 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 also interesting, I think, because of all the drama and the. You know, there's a sense of, like, tragedy and waste. The Carolinas campaign just, it, it just seems goofy at that point. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> especially when you get into North Carolina, because South Carolina, you have, like, the burning of Columbia, which is a whole controversy all its own, you know. Um, so, yeah, so what are we at right now? Yeah, yeah, okay, so... Yeah, um, so now we got, uh, yeah, people, mm. are sh people have shown up, and I guess they're ready to set sail, or... Is, what's the modern term like? Get underway, uh, fire the reactor. I don't know. <laughs> what about that horrible joke where the person says "fire at will" and they go, "What's will? Who's will?" I haven't heard that one, but that's pretty bad. Oh god. Yeah, yeah. You hear it like crappy cartoon shows and stuff. Yeah, it sounds like some form of Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah, like you know, like a, almost like a Ninja Turtles thing, right? Like, yeah, like the know, joke they insert imagine, like, for you know the poor dad who's stuck. Watching this bullshit with his kids. Yeah. Like, you know, the Shredder says that, and then Bebop and Rocks the are like, well, which one's Will? <laughs> oh. People are saying the term is now cast off. Cast off. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Okay. So let me get a swig of water here, and we'll get into the uh, overall development of the aircraft carrier. All right. Mm. So for this, we're going to be talking about... Um, all right, so we're going to be talking about um, the carrier's development. In this case, uh, chronicling both uh, a bit about ship design, 
doctrine and what the various countries are up to. And of course, with the carrier's application through World War II and how that progresses. Uh, it's interesting to note, of course, that the idea of using ships, aircraft with warships came in 1910 with the development of the float plane. Damn, that's pretty early. I know. You know, there's something interesting, though. I was, I was, um, you know, they, they were... In this phase, there's so much creativity and energy and go and go get them that we just don't have anymore. Right? So... And I mean, I know, I know. In one ways, it's kind of, it's kind of like dark because you're like, wait. So the airplane gets invented, and very quickly, people are like, okay, how do we kill people with this thing? Like very quickly, right? How do we kill people with this new contraption? But yeah, they're, they're, they're. Um, I want to say, uh, oh man, who's the first? The French. The French actually developed the first seaplane carrier. Oh. And so the seaplane carrier would essentially just be a transport. That would then place a seaplane in the water. Seaplane takes off, returns to its ship, goes inside. The idea at this point was using these for scouting, really. Yep. But even then, very early on, they start using them for bombing and attacks. The first one is actually done by the Japanese with the Wakamiya, which was their seaplane carrier. It bombed German positions in China. So just for context, though, uh, planes at this time could only fly for, what, 30 minutes at a time around 1910? So this is uh, literally you scout right over the horizon and come back. Yeah, and exactly, uh, which, which, is, which is useful. Uh, and as we, all, as we both know that when we did the World War I stream, the aircraft is getting better very quickly, you know. So one that's also going to happen later on with this, this is a big deal in the 1920s, is going to be gunnery spotting. But I am getting a little bit ahead of myself. So it's interesting to note that in the First World War, you are seeing aircraft carriers being used, but not like the flat tops that we're thinking of, at least at this point. Uh, so used for scouting, light bombing attacks. The French have them, the British and the Japanese in particular. The Americans will eventually have one as well. Uh, the um, <clears throat> first one that's going to be a flat top carrier is going to be the HMS Furious. Uh, HMS, well, there was the Ark Royal, but the Furious is the first one that's going to be a flat top from, um, is the first one to be a flat top that we would think of as a real carrier. Furious is a conversion of these battle cruisers that were very, they, or, or sometimes you might think of them as like heavy, heavy, heavy cruisers. They were put up by uh, Lord Jackie Fisher. It became known as Fisher's Follies because these ships are considered to be, like, their armor is almost non-existent. <laughs> um, so it was eventually decided to convert Furious, Glorious, and Courageous into aircraft carriers, with Furious being the first one. Um, by the way, Furious will launch the first proper carrier raid in 1918. Oh. Bombing a German Zeppelin plant. Very successful bombing raid. But the ship at this point did not have any way to recover the aircraft, so the eight Sopwith camels, like, either had to fly to Denmark or ditch in the ocean. You know what this looks like from the one picture I found? Uh, it kind of looks like a really goofy-looking cruise ship. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. <laughs> so, the British are the ones who used the air aircraft carriers the most extensively during World War One. And so they really are the uh, the forefront in this case. Um, but now you're going to get into the interwar period. And this is where things get very interesting because <clears throat> very early on people start trying to make purpose-built carriers. Now the first one to be laid down was Hermes, but the first one to actually be finished was the Japanese carrier Hosho. Hermes, by the way, is a British carrier. And oh, by the way, HMS Argus is the first one that's a flat top from beginning to end. Um, most of your 1920 ships are going to be conversions from other ships. A lot of this has to do with the Washington Naval Treaty. Do you know much about this? Well, I know it placed limits on how many ships different countries would possess, but I don't know a lot of the details. It put a tonnage limit on several different classes with the... Japanese being unable to win parity with the Americans and British, which which they felt deeply insulted. Um, people like Yamamoto would point out that actually, because of America's productive capacity, it actually meant that the Japanese, 
Like the, the fact that the Americans, the fact that it put limits on the Americans was to Japan's advantage, is what he was saying. You know. Yeah, that's probably uh, true. Anyway. I mean, because yeah, uh, Japan, I mean, as we've discussed in the past, once they started losing ships, they really couldn't replace them, at least not easily. Whereas the U.S. could replace their ships relatively easily. Relatively, yeah. So. When you get to this point, you get into the 1920s, you have these purpose-built carriers, but mostly which have are conversions, because the the treaty limits meant that certain ships that had already that construction had already started on were not able to be completed due to the limits. So for instance, the Lexington was originally supposed to be a battle cruiser. The decision was made instead to convert both Lexington and Saratoga into carriers. Uh, very large carriers, by the way. Uh, you know, they're, the Lexington and, Lexington and Saratoga are a real step up in terms of tonnage and aircraft they can carry. Uh, the Japanese will convert the Akagi, which was going to be a battle cruiser. The other battle cruiser gonna, they were going to convert was destroyed in the Great Earthquake that struck in 1923. Do you know much? Do you know much about this earthquake, by the way? No, I don't. It killed as many as 100 to 150 thousand people. God damn! I mean, truly horrific. Uh, Anyway, that, that, I mean, yeah, that hurricane was so bad, it also um, had created tsunamis that struck across the Pacific. Anyway, so it caused serious damage to the other ones, so instead they converted a battleship, the Kaga, into a carrier. Which meant the Kaga was a little slower than the Akagi. All right. <clears throat> so who the, was the, was there a person who around this time started to theorize that carriers might be the mainstay of the future or was there still kind of a battleship first mentality or how did that work in terms of at naval point, theory at the 1920s is battleship first understandably the aircraft just isn't that powerful it lacks range and punch they're mostly thought of as for scouting for light bombing raids and gunnery spotting because they're starting to get radios installed uh, it's only as the aircraft is getting more robust especially in the 1930s that you really get you know a, a, a more of a, a merging carrier doctrine although one of the men who's really at the forefront of this is Ernest J. King uh, his favorite ship was the Lexington uh, he was involved in uh, numerous uh, fleet exercises in the 1920s of course eventually became head of the Navy very much a champion of the aircraft carrier so the Lexington uh, was already out in the 20s. Yeah, like 1927, I want to say. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it just so anyway, so that's what's really that. that so at this point, it's more going to be about scouting. Um, the aircraft is getting much more powerful as time goes on. Now, what's going to happen with the carrier doctrine for each one of them going in through the 1920s into the 30s? The British start to play around with the idea of the armored flight deck. Okay, so you know they they you know they, they the British finish of course they have um, you know the uh, courageous, furious, and glorious. They have Hermes and Eagle. Uh, Hermes and Eagle are smaller carriers. Eagle in particular is fairly slow. In 1938, they come up with Ark Royal. Ark Royal at that point is a fairly large aircraft carrier, but even then it doesn't have a massive flight wing. The Ark Royal had a little bit of armored deck protection. Not a ton, like under an inch. The British idea for the next class, which is the illustrious, is their idea is simply this. The carrier, the carrier cannot put up enough aircraft to defend itself properly from a sustained air attack. And that is an understandable conclusion because you know radar is still new it hasn't been well integrated and so the british are thinking like you know if, if a massive air raid shows up against the carrier this thing's going to sink because everybody recognizes very early on these ships are vulnerable so the british get this idea of the armored flight deck in which case what happens is you're going to have an encased hangar you know or like under the hangar and then you have armored flight deck. I want to say there's about three inches. That's what this has the effect of doing, though, is it reduces the amount of aircraft they can carry. 
So the so the British um, are going in for a defensive stance, and this makes sense for the situation they're in at that moment. All right. Now the <clears throat> sorry. Now you have the Americans. The Americans are going to have an uh, open hangar, so that's good for ventilation. They do not want an armored flight deck. They are emphasizing maximum punch. So, of course, like I said, you had Lexington. Eventually, you also have the Ranger, which was built. Not a particularly good carrier. But then you have the Yorktown class, which was superb. Like, one of your best carriers of the war. It's a large amount of stuff that can carry. There's also a Wasp, but Wasp was a one-off. That was made because they had excess tonnage left over from the Washington uh, Naval Treaty. And um, Wasp was not the best, but it, once again, it could carry a lot of aircraft. So that's to keep in mind the Americans, they're emphasizing large numbers of aircraft. However, their doctrine called for the carriers to be in separate fleets. So their task force would have one, sometimes two carriers in it. And what this meant is the Americans are not very good at coordinating mass strikes. But it also has the effect of dispersing your fleet, and thereby it is also a form of defense. Because if the enemy finds one group, they may not find the other one. Whereas if they're all concentrated together and they find you, well, they know where all your carriers are. So it is a form of defense, but it also makes coordination harder. It should also be kept in mind comparing the Americans and the British in this case. Um, the fleet air arm was chronically underfunded. There's more emphasis on bombers and, you know, defense of the country. So the fleet air arm was not getting the best stuff. Also, the fleet air arm was very much interested in a fighter bomber. So that's how you get things like the, um, oh God, what's that one? It's the, uh, man, I'm drawing a blank on that one. The, the uh, mosquito? No, no, not the mosquito. Mosquito's a different uh, thing altogether. Um, let me see if I can pull this one up here. But they had a, um, their attempts to have these, like, you know, combined fighter-bomber types led to some aircraft that were heavy. And, you know, I mean, they're heavy, they're sturdy, but they're not particularly nimble, you know? Because yeah, I know eventually uh, they had to, you know, make the Sea Fire, the, uh, you know, naval Spitfire. Yeah, yeah, the Sea Fire and the Sea Hurricane as well. Uh, the Sea Fire had some problems, of course, because, you know, you're trying to convert a land-based plane into a carrier. So... Eventually they got it working, but it took a lot of trial and error for that one. Yeah, because I mean, the, the Spitfire, even though it's, you know, this iconic aircraft, it was not the sturdiest frame. It was kind of light, uh, so if you're trying to do carrier work with that frame, you're going to put a lot of strain on it. I don't think Sea Fires lasted very long. They had to be rotated out pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um... Now, Fleet Air Arm, uh, man, I'm trying to blank on this. And actually, the, the, this this airplane I'm thinking of was so large, it actually started equipping with radar sets. It was made by Ferry, which is famous for creating the swordfish. You know much about the swordfish? Um, not a ton about the swordfish. I'm familiar with the Gladiator, which I think could also be on carriers, right? No, no, Gladiator was a land-based one. Uh, that was a, that was a that was another biplane. Ferry Swordfish um, was a biplane, torpedo plane mostly um yeah so so anyway um that's why that they're 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 emphasizing aircraft that can be multi-purpose although not all of them are and that's because they have small flight wings because you would if you have a smaller group of aircraft you're going to need that when i say small you know your illustrious class is ru holding roughly 30 aircraft that can vary depending on the size of the planes Whereas your Japanese carriers are having like 60, 70, maybe over 80 sometimes. And the American carriers, same thing, 70, 80, even more than that. Especially when the Essex class comes out. So those are two big differences between how the British and the Americans are approaching things. The Japanese, on the other hand, are just building all sorts of fun stuff. <laughs> uh... The, the, the Japanese are really, um, they never truly have a standardized view of what a carrier is supposed to be. And you could put that up to a lot of experimentation uh, within the Japanese Navy. 
Uh, also, the Japanese had, did a lot of, had a lot of ships that were civilian ships that were designed to be quickly converted into warships in particular carriers. So famously, they had two ocean liners whose thing was, yeah, they are ocean liners, but if a war happens or they know a war's going to happen, they get converted to carriers, that being the Junyo and the Hiyo. Or in case you have like the Zui, the Zuiho and the Shoho, which were uh, converted um, fast transports, oil tankers, I believe. Um, but anyway, so the Japanese uh, will have the Soryu and the Hiryu, which are very fast fleet carriers. They don't carry as much. They carry fewer aircraft than most of the other ones. They have almost no armor at all. In fact, that's something to keep in mind, too. This is the thing about the Japanese. The Japanese carriers have an enclosed hangar. No armor on the flight deck. They do not emphasize defenses. The Japanese are all about attack, attack, attack. And that means to have the biggest concentration, by 1940, they are keeping all their carriers together in large fleet groups so they can launch mass air attacks that are potent and powerful. Um, to be a naval airman, of course, is not easy. There's a lot of training involved. But I think you could pretty much say that in the 1930s, the Japanese have the most rigorous training program for their pilots. Also, even before World War II happens, their pilots have the most combat experience because they flew missions in China. You know, now, Grant's going to stationary targets, but still, that is combat experience. And they were very effective as well. So, you know, you, you, you're you already seeing the Japanese um, aircraft carriers doing well in the Battle of Shanghai, for instance. Uh, so, so the Japanese, for that reason, their carrier operations become really efficient. They can launch a lot of aircraft relatively quickly, much faster than we ever could, and at least up until 1943. Uh, but... Their carriers are also floating gas cans because extra space in the hull is where they pack aviation fuel in. Because, you know, you're making these long trips across the Pacific, right? Yeah. So I guess they're <laughs> just thinking pure offense. We will find them before they find us and take them out. Insane. Yeah, exactly. Well. Now, it's probably worth noting what the hell is going on with the other countries of the world, right? Like, what's the, so what's the Soviet Union doing, Italy and the rest? Well, the French also have an aircraft carrier. It's called the Bern. It's sometimes it's a, it's a, it's a, it's got a decent sized air wing, but it's it's rather slow. Um, they they finished it in 1927. Uh, the the French though, I mean, they have the Bern. They're using it. It is active, but the French really aren't emphasizing aircraft carriers, and it's understandable. The French Navy is not is not as well funded as the American, British, or Japanese. But also, the French are allied to the British, and their strategy is, if a war breaks out, especially by the 1930s, with the late 1930s, they're thinking is, war breaks out, it'll be Germany and Italy versus us, right? So they're going to do what they did in the First World War, which is the British handle the Atlantic, the French handle the Mediterranean. Well, I, I don't know, so the I French thought for a long time they assumed that, they, uh, that Italy wouldn't side with Hitler. No, not by the late 1930s, but even then, the French, um, throughout the 1920s and into the early 1930s, remember, Germany doesn't have an army, effectively. But right. Italy does. And Italy has a very large navy. Italy has the fifth largest navy in the world. They also were involved in the Washington Naval Treaty. And the Italians, by the way, considered themselves to have gotten a good deal during the treaty. So the French navy is really geared for a war with Italy, even before Mussolini is friends with Hitler because it, because truly it is, their, it is their most likely opponent. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. And so I, I guess uh, you know, speaking of Italy, I, it's safe to say they did not put a lot of effort into their naval air arm just based on uh, the problems they ran into once the war started. Yeah, yeah. They uh, well, they had a lot of problems with coordination, and that that's one of the things that Mussolini, Mussolini himself, one time said, "Italy doesn't need Italy is an aircraft carrier. We don't need one." Yeah, I love that <laughs> quote. Yeah, I mean, now the Italians did have a, um, sorry, the Italians did have a, uh, a seaplane carrier, but that was pretty much it. Um, in the case of the aircraft carriers, eventually the Italians started working on what's called the Aquilia, uh, which seems to have been a pretty decent design, from what I can tell. Uh, but it also also had a um, 
armored flight deck, although not as armored as a British one. Kind of like a like 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 a step below the British armor on, on the flight deck. Anyway, so point is, Aquilia, good carrier. They really didn't start working on it until the war is going on. They realize how much they could use a carrier. So what the French are doing is they're looking at Italy and they're thinking to themselves, look, these guys aren't even making an aircraft carrier. And in some ways it's understandable. Aircraft carriers will turn out to be very useful in the Mediterranean. But, you know, a carrier is obviously more useful in the Pacific, given the uh, the vast expanse of the ocean, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so the so the French understandably don't really invest heavily in the in the, making a carrier force. And of course the French aircraft industry had a lot of problems in the 1930s, which is one of the, which is I think a major reason why they're going to lose in 1940. Uh, so yeah, so the French do have a carrier, but that's pretty much it for them. They're not it's not really the thing they're involved in. Uh, probably worth mentioning real quick, what about the Germans? Uh, the thing with the Germans is Eric Rader very early on sees the usefulness of an aircraft carrier. And Eric Rader is sometimes credited as one of, the, one of, if not the first, guy to really think of the idea of a task force. So in his, like, pipe dream head, like if Eric Rader, if, like, God came down and told Eric Rader, you can have whatever you want, he wanted a fleet that would actually have one to two carriers in it and plenty of battleships. And so he was actually thinking very much in a balanced way. Even though I'd say Eric Rader probably favored the battleship a little more than the aircraft carrier, he's still thinking relatively balanced. The problem is funding, shipyards, uh, you know, the, the Kriegsmarine is only just getting funding as the war starts. They are not ready for war. Uh, God, what did Raider say when the war started? He said, all we can do is die with honor. Huh. Because of how gun they are. <laughs> um so yeah, so the Germans were the Germans were thinking about hey, it would be really cool to have an aircraft carrier. <laughs> yeah, that was, they they were um, they were they knew what was going on in the other navies of the world. Uh, they did try to build one, the Graf Zeppelin, which got very close to completion. But I mean, by the time it's almost ready, the German navy has suffered major setbacks. This is around the time of the defeat of Stalingrad, of course, the Battle of the Barents Sea, which uh, Teak just did a really really great video on. I think it's one of the best ones he's done all year. Uh, so uh, cool. eventually they just decide we can't, we're not going to do the Graf Zeppelin. So Graf Zeppelin is out. You're not going to get that one. They did try to convert some other ships into carriers. Those designs didn't look so great. But yeah, the Germans were not ignoring uh, car aircraft carrier development. They just didn't have the means to really pursue it. Yeah, but to circle back to Italy for a minute... Um... One, I think I mentioned it before we talked about the faction analysis or something like that, but um, the Italians literally could not use the fleet that they had because of how badly they neglected the coordination between air and naval assets. So eventually they figured out that because the British had seaplanes, they had to have air protection or they would be fucked if they're going to take on the British. So uh, they started putting their planes, their land planes out to cover the fleet. The problem is that their planes kept attacking them because none of the pilots were trained to identify Italian versus British or French ships. So eventually Mussolini had to park yeah. the entire fleet in port because he could not trust his air force to attack the right ships. Mm. Uh, what about the Soviet Union? I'm going to guess they don't have one. <laughs> yeah. They kind of a problem the Germans have. The the Russian Civil War had been so destructive uh, that the that it was very hard to get to to even build warships. Really, uh, so the Soviet Navy is very much um, underfunded throughout into the 1930s. Stalin's emphasis, understandably, is on aircraft and eventually tanks. You know, you know, land war. But by the late 1930s, Stalin does start to push for the Soviet Navy having to be large. Now, Russia's always had the problem that, you know, that they, they have, that they essentially are divided into four fleet areas that are not easy to connect with each other. You know, Northern Fleet, Baltic Fleet, Black Sea Fleet, Pacific Fleet. Uh, the larger fleet for the Russians, their bigger concern would be, the, would be the Baltic Fleet, with the Black Sea Fleet being a close second. Northern and Pacific are kind of like naval backwaters for them at the time. Uh, but Stalin does authorize the construction of a monstrous battleship. That, would, that thing would have been a real behemoth if it came out. 
and some actually good carrier designs that were essentially like the British armored carriers, but with even bigger flight wings. But these were only planned and projected. Not much work was really done on them beyond that because, you know, the Germans invade and, you know, you got to put your resources into something else. You know. Uh, so that's just the story of the Soviets. From what we do know of their plans, it looked like they were decently designed carriers, but, you know, the, the, the Navy was so neglected through the 20s and 30s. And I think I was telling you that about that earlier in a conversation we had about how just how bad the Soviet Navy did in a lot of regards, you know. Um, just a lot of problems and their submarines. I mean, they had, a, they had a massive submarine force, but their subs were, they hit mines all the time, which understandably the Baltic is heavily mined, but still they lost all these subs to mines and their submarines were like very noisy. So they're almost comically easy to detect. The, the, the Soviet submarine force got slaughtered in World War II. I mean, really, really did poorly. I think even the, were, didn't the Germans have E-boats, which were kind of like not submarines, but sort of like a halfway between a submarine and a, and a patrol boat. Am I getting that right? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Those are just kind of like, you know, kind of like PT boats. Uh, the German E-boat is typically considered the best of that variety, although, you know, the PT boat was good. The Italians actually had a very good motor attack boat as well. Yes, yeah, so I think I even think... the E-boats were just tearing ass you know, vis-a-vis the Soviet Navy, from what I understand. Yeah. No, Soviet Navy is nothing to be too afraid of, really. Um, uh, now, of course, their sailors were oftentimes used as infantry and did could do quite well. You know? Yeah, no, their their naval brigades look pretty cool if you play with them in Panzer General too. They have <laughs> yeah, their little they sailor <laughs> outfits on, and you know they usually just get overrun by Panzers, but uh, yeah, <laughs> they look good while doing it at least. One fun one I want to mention, uh, I don't, they didn't do too much in carrier development, but they did get interested when the war started, was actually the Dutch. Uh, so the Dutch did operate uh, some, what you might call like a like carrier escorts, even like merchant carriers, so like very, very light. They didn't carry too much, right? Um, but the Dutch, they, they actually wanted to try to buy ships from America or Britain during World War II. Um so, but anyway, so the Dutch did operate some carriers during the war, but they really weren't involved in anything development-wise interwar period. You know, although, although as, as Germany was getting more aggressive, the Dutch did drop plans to create battle cruisers. Uh, so, they were going to do their own little uh, naval expansion at that point. So, I guess they never so, got that out of the dock, though. No, not really. Uh, once again, good designs. And, you know, Dutch ship designs were solid. They were particularly known for excellent anti-aircraft guns. You know, and of course the Dutch fleet will end up fighting the Japanese at the uh, Battle of the Java Sea, among other things. So, when it comes to naval ships of this period, what was the best anti-aircraft weapon? Oh, it's going to be the um... oh, God. I'm forgetting the precise name for it. You know, I got to be honest, man. I never really remember anti-aircraft gun names. Um, you know, Balfers in uh, Sweden made a lot of good ones. We made use of those. But uh, Drakenfeld did a whole video talking about what was the best anti-aircraft gun. And the Americans generally had the best ones. Um, the British ones were kind of middle of the road. Same thing with the Germans. Italian and Japanese tended to be pretty bad. Huh. I'd probably say the Italians had the worst overall. Because yeah, I'll say, the Japanese ones can't be terrible because, I mean, they did inflict some heavy losses in the early naval battles when the big carrier uh, battles. No. Oh, so that was just the Jap Zero, then? Yeah, no. The, well, that's the thing, too. The, the, the British, keep, you, keep in mind, the British carriers actually did have more anti-aircraft guns than ships of their size usually in the British Navy, and they're built to take punishment, right? The Japanese did the opposite of the British. They emphasize having a carrier air, ca- combat air patrol. You know? And to be honest, even though their combat air patrol eventually fails at Midway, it's punching, it's doing really well for that period, considering they don't have radar. Right? Yes. And you're mauling those squadrons that are coming in. So the Japanese really did emphasize combat air patrol uh, over anti-aircraft guns. As the war goes on, they keep putting more and more anti-aircraft guns on their ships. The problem is, a lot of them just aren't that good. 
So, okay, it's great. You got more of them. That's better than you had before. But it's not a good... Their, their main anti-aircraft gun of the war was not good. <laughs> so was it a problem of the gun that had the range, the velocity? Was it a sighting issue? I mean, what was the... Cause I yeah, guess... there were problems. Yeah. There were, there were problems in sighting. Uh, it, it didn't traverse very quickly, as I recall. You know, I have to, I'm going to pull up one of these ships. I'm just pull one of them up right here, okay? Okay. You know, um, then I also want to get into the uh, controversy with the, uh, um, no, not that one. Yeah, I got like the Type 96. I see it. 25 millimeter. Um, that was one. Of the, that was that was a fairly common one. Uh, but anyway, so uh, French design, French anti-aircraft guns weren't particularly great either. But I see here and there. All right, so that's essentially what the the three main carrier powers going to the war will be: America, Britain, Japan. They have some similarities in doctrine, but you can see there's a lot of differences going in. So how will these pan out? Well, of course, the British are going to get a lot of experience up front. Now, the British actually take some considerable losses at first. HMS Courageous is sunk by a U-boat, and Ark Royal is almost sunk as well. Uh, this means the British actually do not use their carriers anymore in hunter-killer groups. Okay? So the British first idea was that they would deploy these aircraft carriers to go hunt for U-boats. It's actually a great idea. Right? But when the Courageous really shocks them, the fact that Ark Royal almost gets hit, the Brit other British carriers aren't ready yet, so they start to hold them back. HMS Glorious is actually sunk by the battle cruisers Nisenau and Scharnhorst during the uh, Norway campaign. Uh... The story of that is absolutely ridiculous. The commander in the the, the, the Glorious is only being defended by two destroyers. Uh, the guy in charge of the aircraft carrier, I forget his name, but he did not know what he was doing. He was he sometimes called the worst carrier commander of World War II. <laughs> like yeah, I think I don't I don't even think he had proper scouting up. So yeah, two battle cruisers sneak up on a carrier and sink it. So he's like the Percival um, of the British Navy. Yeah, but dude, this really gives the battleship club some uh, some cannon fodder. And let's think about that for a second with the whole, like, carrier versus battleship. It really is a misnomer to say that the carrier completely outclasses the battleship right away. Battleships are not vulnerable toys that you easily sink. They're very difficult, especially later in the war as they have tons of anti-aircraft guns on them. And remember, a battleship is built to take punishment from, you know, cannons that are 12... 14, 15, 16. Hell, the Yamato is an 18-inch cannon. So, these are ships built to take punishment. Uh, so, battleships are not vulnerable little things a carrier can just flick away. Now, the carrier, when it has proper radar, and especially scout aircraft, it can spot a battleship and get away from it. Especially if the carrier is properly protected. You know, so, as long as you're doing that... For a battleship to sink a carrier is going to have to be a case like with Glorious where everything just aligns at that moment. But what I'm saying is it doesn't mean that the battleship... The carrier outclassed the battleship, but the battleship is not an easy target. It is very difficult to sink. All right? Yeah, and it's also definitely not outdated in World War II. I mean, they came in pretty damn handy, especially with amphibious landings. Yes, with amphibious landings. It should also be, count and it should also be considered that, I mean... Uh, you know, the, the, the carriers, like in the Guadalcanal, Guadalcanal campaign, both sides' carriers were so wiped out and exhausted that the campaign in many ways comes down to a battleship duel. You know, so... <laughs> yeah, the battleship, I mean, yeah, this is, this is not Jutland, but the battleship is not a wholly outdated piece of hardware. And, and of course, if you're going to fight a surface battle, and surface battles are very important, you're going to want to have a battleship with you if you can. Yeah, I mean, I sort of feel like in many ways the battleship got eclipsed not so much because it was inherently obsolete as because at by the end of World War II, the only other naval superpower rival was gone. So there won't be any more major fleet-on-fleet -fleet actions that would require you to stand and trade blows. Oh, I see what you mean. 
Yeah, that's 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 a good point there. Remember, they did bring the battleships back in the 1980s. Remember that? Yeah, they brought back the Missouri for the Gulf War, and it just became a cruise missile platform. Yeah, um, decommissioned uh, in the early 1990s. And you know what happened after it was decommissioned, though, right? During the decommission thing. No. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones took it over with help from Gary Busey, but eventually right. they were. De- eventually, though, they were defeated by one Steven Seagal. Yes, uh, that legendary man who uh, trained with a master in Japan who had died a year before he arrived. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Uh, also, if you've seen that movie, uh, I think it's I think it's Battleship, it's supposed to be based on the board game, but it's about how when aliens arrive, they destroy all the modern ships because they disable their computers. So the U.S. has to take an old battleship and they get some old sailors on it who show the younger guys how to use the stuff. And they go out and fight the aliens and dis- defeat them with a battleship. Yes, I heard about this. Uh, Liam Neeson's the captain, isn't he? Yeah, and this movie is fucking terrible, by the way. So this is not a recommendation, merely um, a comment. Yeah. And not bad in a good way, just bad. Yeah. A quick aside about Steven Seagal, because I was just kind of curious about him. I actually just recently found out about where he claimed to study under a master, you know, who um, was already gone. Um, yeah, Steven Seagal, like, I mean, he was in these, like, kind of low-budget action films in the late 80s, early 90s, like, you know, like, Out for Justice. And the movies were successful. They just weren't giant hits or anything, but they were successful. But then Under Siege actually is, like, a big hit. And that's why you got to see him for so long. You know? Yeah, well, it's, it's funny, I don't know if I've ever told you, but my friend Delano, who's basically, in many ways, his PhD is in pop culture. Um, he he claims that the reason why Seagal became a star is that there were two executives, and they looked at Seagal, and one of them bet the other. He's, he's like, I can make this insufferable, ugly douchebag into a star. And it was a bet between two rich producers. I can see that. It also helped that he was at the he, in the nineteen eighties. He was like doing martial. He was a martial arts trainer and was well regarded in that. Oh yeah, he was good uh, back then. But of course, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, no, no. I mean, he, you know, no, no. I'm not taking away from that guy. That that, that, that he had he had the, he had the moves. You know. No, and, uh, and because he's big, because he got the size. I mean, you believe that Steven Seagal would beat the fuck out of somebody. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like with, with Jackie Chan it's kind of like cutesy when he's fighting because he's small so it's like he's embarrassing people not really hurting them and with Seagal you know you believe no he is hurting them they're going to be feeling that for months if not years <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no, no, it, it, no it is it is that is true he just he just has no charisma and takes himself too seriously also but he I runs like a girl uh, have you ever noticed that <laughs> it's weird because, I mean, he's a pretty, he's like a big, very masculine guy, but when he starts running, it, he looks like a five-year-old girl. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, I mean, when I say when he used to run, of course, because I don't think he's done yeah. that in about 20 years. Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say there's two things Seagal did, though, that I liked in his career. Uh, executive decision, you know, where he dies 45 minutes into the movie. Yeah. Yeah, that that that's a, that's a solid action film, and uh, they just killed him forty five minutes in the movie, and at the time it shocked everyone, because you know they're like they're like Kurt Russell, Steven Seagal, and we're thinking like okay these two macho guys are gonna team up and kick ass. No, Seagal dies, bold move, you know, and that really actually made the rest of the movie very tense because you were like wait these fuckers will do anything. They just killed Seagal, right? And then the other one was he did the Onion movie where he just has a bit part in it where he plays cock he, he's in the movie called cock puncher where he's learned the ancient art of punching dudes in the groin yeah <laughs> uh it's it's pretty rare when you can get seagal to do a comedic role and i i love that story of how he went on saturday night live and all of his ideas for comedy are just him beating people up and he, he, <laughs> yeah. has, he has no comprehension of what a joke is or what what would be funny he has no self-awareness and then the, the skit he came up with for the grand finale was there's an oil company board meeting and he just goes in there and beats the shit out of everybody and then tells them that we need to protect the environment. And that's the whole thing. That's the joke. Oh, God. 
Wait, that later on became the movie uh, Fire Down Below, right? Or was that... It might have been after that, because he, he made that movie twice. He made it in Ken Kentucky, then he made it in Alaska on Deadly Ground, which I guess was earlier. Yeah. But, I mean, that was, that was like, the one idea he had in his life back when he was, I guess, a left-wing action star in the 90s. And then, uh, in recent years, of course, he's become pretty right-wing, and he associates closely with uh, Trump. And he also defends Vladimir Putin a lot on TV. Although, apparently, Putin distanced himself from Seagal. Well, yeah, of course. Because you know, <laughs> Putin, Putin's, like I said, because Putin's, a, a, what, like, a, like an intelligent, strategic thinker overall, and those don't... You know, like, yeah, I mean, it's just know. like, um, I mean, if Seagal is willing to go to bat for you, I mean, you'll pay him a little bit of respect here and there, but you're not going to, you're not going to make him your spokesman if you can avoid it. <laughs> uh, it's just like, I mean, with, with Kim Jong-un, I mean, he sided with Dennis Rodman for a while, but yeah, I don't know, I feel like Rodman is still a step above Seagal just because Rodman obviously has his personal demons, but there aren't a lot of stories of him randomly mm -hmm. going ape shit and beating the crap out of people for no reason on movie sets. I will have to say that Robin was in that movie uh, Double Team with Jean Claude Van Damme. Really, really awful movie. Okay. It is. Um, and I gotta say that Seagal is a better actor than Rodman. Well, I mean, Rodman's to be fair, Robin only had one movie though, so. True. In theory, he could have been better. Robin's funny in that movie unintentionally, you know, but I will say this last thing I'd say about this. Of all those, like, action stars of that time, you know, like, I, I mean, I guess you want to stretch it to the 70s, you can include Bronson and Eastwood. Uh, but of all those, like, 70s, 80s, 90s action stars, I think Seagal is the second worst. Behind the worst. Norris? Or? Be... Norris. Yeah. Norris is always the worst. Chuck yeah. Norris is always the worst. The man of one facial expression. <laughs> he has absolutely no personality. He can never deliver a line. Ever. Although, All right. um, if we're talking about a real fight, though, even when Seagal was still in shape, I think Chuck Norris would have beat the fuck out of him. Would have beat the fuck out of... Um, Seagal. Out of, uh, probably, because... I mean, Norris was a legit great martial artist. Once again, not taking that away from the guy. But also, um, Seagal was... Um, his martial arts was, I think, it's Aikido, which is not the best, actually. Yeah, I mean, it's basically <laughs> if some combat. if some untrained idiot comes at you with a knife and they make a frontal attack at your when you're facing them, you can disarm them and hit them and maybe break their arm. But yeah. otherwise, there aren't that many Aikido moves. Um, so it's, it's basically yeah, a, yeah. a martial art for people in very limited situations, and it's doable by people who aren't that mobile. Uh, so basically, if you have any other form of martial art where you can say move laterally, yeah, you're going to beat somebody who's doing a keto. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no Norris, you no know, legit fighter, just just awful at <laughs> being in movies. <laughs> um, you know, although, although oh fuck, I do. I want to one thing before. Just one thing real quick. Uh, Van Dam, you mentioned him and the, the executive thing. The reason Van Damme got hired, apparently, is he went to Golden Globus, you know, Canon Films, you know, known for such great things as Masters of the Universe and Superman 4. Well, he goes to those people, and he impressed them when he just showed them, like, his leg kicks. And, like, you think he, like, kicked a cigarette out of somebody's mouth, and they were like, we gotta make this guy a star. So that's that's why we've been saddled with Van Damme, okay? Yeah, I mean, Van Damme's a hell of an athlete, though. I mean, uh... He's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he can't act, but at least he, he has the action part down to the point where I think of, of all those guys from that era, he's probably the best pure athlete. Uh, probably so. I gotta say, though, uh, Van Damme's acting got a lot better when he got older. Yes. He, he, and, you know, those Expendables movies suck, but he was actually good in his villain role they did in them. Uh, but anyway, let's go ahead and get back into the aircraft carrier. Right. So, uh, the right. thing that Seagal so, would eventually work on. So, concluding with the battleship, the battleship is it's not that it, the battleship is now is no longer the primary weapon, but the battleship is not a chump. Now, as you said, very good for shore bombardment. Must be added, though, that it would be, that, that the battleship's effectiveness in shore bombardment is just the weight of the cannon you're throwing, and it's really good at blowing apart a fixed position. Destroyers were very useful for shore bombardment because they could get in close. Yeah. And you could direct their fire a bit better. 
Um, if anything, the cruiser was the one that wasn't so uh, that was not as good as it should have been, you know. But anyway, so yeah. but to build on an earlier point I was making, I think if uh, Germany and Japan had won the war, the battleship would not have gone away. Because if you think about what it's really useful for, it's the threat of destroying an entire city in like an hour. You know, you just sell it to the city in the harbor and you say, okay, give us what we want or the city goes away. And for Germany and Japan, that would not have been a moral quandary. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're the U.S., you can't really do that. Yeah. So. I don't know. We were firebombing. Well, that's true, but only during the war. I mean, I don't think Germany and Japan would have softened after the war. At least that wasn't their plan, from what I can tell. No, oh, I see. Which, no, 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 no. Most certainly not. Um, so, okay, what's going to happen is is that um, uh, I was going to say. Okay, so the British uh, have some problems at first with the courageous and the lost, the glorious, but they really come into their own in the Mediterranean. That's what they're doing very, very effectively. All right. Um. So anyway, so they use their aircraft carriers effectively against the Italians. The aircraft carriers allow them to protect convoys going into Malta, which which is extremely important. And then, of course, you get the raid at Taranto, which is where the they launch a small air raid on the Italian fleet anchorage at Taranto in southern Italy and sink three battleships. Now, all three battleships will be raised and repaired, however... It's their losses the Italians cannot take at this moment. And by that point, the Italians, the Italian Navy had already tussled with the British a bit. Those battles were these, they, they, they were these large naval battles where nothing got sunk because both sides kept it ext extreme long range. In fact, what's often considered the longest range battleship hit ever happens when the war spit hits the uh, Julius Caesar. Uh, but anyway, so... The Julius Caesar, who uh, had the Caesar... Oh, the Italians, of course. Oh, oh, of course. Probably like the Julio Cesar. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's spelled in their way. I'm just, I'm just calling it Julius Caesar right now. I gotcha. Um, yeah, the British Battleship War Spit did that one. Uh, so anyway, so what happens is is that um, the the Durham Taranto real. I mean, the Italians by that point they had not gotten their licks in when they could have. The loss of three battleships, including the one of their newest ones, the Litrero, Litterio, uh, this is a turning point. And along with the Battle of Cape Matapan, where the Italians lose several heavy cruisers and almost lose the battleship Vertirio Vento. Another big turning point for the carrier showing its dominance is the Bismarck. German battleship Bismarck is, of course, discovered by aircraft. This is after it sinks the hood, but it took damage. Battleship Bismarck is then found, and the British launch a daring air attack on the Bismarck. Um, the, they're attacking with fairy swordfish aircraft, and what happens is the swordfish is actually do very well because they're biplanes, they're canvas, so the German anti-aircraft gun shells are actually just passing through them instead of exploding. They manage to land a torpedo hit that knocks out the rudder, which was considered the weakest part of the German ship. And so Bismarck cannot properly control itself. It is then cornered and sunk by British battleships. Uh, uh, King George V, and I want to say, was was it Rodney or Nelson that was there? I'm pretty sure it was Rodney. So, you know, they pummel the thing to pieces. So there you go, the Bismarck, the mighty German battleship, maybe the most famous battleship of World War II, laid low by a torpedo launched from a fairy swordfish. Yeah, I feel like so, of, it, of all the... I mean, because there's a lot of romanticization of uh, German equipment from World War II, but I feel like the Bismarck might be the most romanticized single piece of equipment. Yes, and its its power and capability was a bit as was a bit overstated. This is still a really good battleship, by the way. <laughs> I don't want to take anything away from it. The Bismarck's a really good battleship. Um, it's better than the King George V, for instance. King George V is a good battleship, it's just the Bismarck is probably a better one. Um, so yeah, the Bismarck, I mean, it's not like the mightiest battleship ever floated, of course. I mean, that's going to be like the Iowa. Um, you know, and maybe Yama Yamato, right? But the Bismarck is a powerful warship. This is a major vi victory. And keep in mind, at the same time, the Americans, remember, they have Ernest J. King in charge. They're seeing how well the battleship is doing. I'm mean, sorry, how well the aircraft carrier is doing. 
and at the same time they have a devoted they have a carrier devotee in charge so while the Americans are making battleships they're constructing some very excellent battleships such as the South Dakota class and the Iowa class there's not really a debate about who's gonna be the most important thing there is in the Japanese Navy the Japanese every groups riven by factions but the Japanese factions are hardcore in fact you know sometimes they'll kill each other right <laughs> Um, right. Well, that's more Army Navy, but within the Navy, you have the pro battleship or pro surface fleet might be a better way to put it, because a lot of them were more like torpedo experts. And then you have your carrier guys. Now, the actual head of the combined fleet is Yamamoto. He is pro carrier. Uh, but the overall head of the Navy is Nagano, and he's a bit more pro battleship. So there is a, that's one of the reasons why Yamato gets built. It is to say to the battleship club, as they, I think they were called, who felt the carrier was being overemphasized at that point. And to be fair to the battleship club, they were pointing out that, hey, these other countries are building new battleships and we just aren't. We haven't built anything since Nagato. So we really got to get ourselves a super battleship. Uh, do you know about the secrecy behind the construction of Yamato? It's insane. They built it, like they had like, they, they essentially, like, they, they, they put up, like, walls around it so nobody knew exactly what they were constructing. Oh. Well, that's yeah. interesting because that, um, that kind of gets referenced in uh, Yakuza 6 where one of the plot points is that they the Japanese had actually just <laughs> completed the Yamato 2 right when the war ended and they kept it secret, hidden mm. in a ship shed. And then all of a sudden in 2016 it surfaced and then created a global crisis as because japan got found out for lying and keep it in secret yeah <laughs> as if anybody at this point would give a shit about a battleship but <laughs> funny so um so the japanese are gearing up for war the shoho zuiho junyo and hiyo are being converted um and at this time they're also finishing up the shikaku class the Shikaku is... It's a really good debate between which one's better, Shikaku class or Yorktown class. I, I'd probably give the edge to Yorktown, but the Shikakus are great ships. And unlike the previous Japanese carriers, they are they don't they don't have an armored flight deck. They're actually... Their overall structural integrity is just better. They, I'm not, they can't take, like, a punishment the way a British carrier can, but they can take a punishment better than any other Japanese carrier when they're being uh, constructed. Uh, anyways, uh, oh, one other big development to mention with the British. They start introducing the escort carrier. All right. So the, the um, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this earlier, but in World War II, you usually think of carriers in three classes. You have, of course, your fleet carriers. So for the British, the big one's the illustrious. For the Americans, it's going to be Yorktown, Essex. And then for the Japanese, you have like Akagi, Kaga, Soryo Hiryu Shukaku. Then you have your light carriers. Now the British were doing light carriers with things like Hermes and Eagle. Americans really didn't do light carriers until uh, at, until Franklin Roosevelt pushed them into doing it because they had they were making the Cleveland class light cruiser and he said like hey we're not building any carriers right now let's build these light carriers and that would be the Independence class which is very good doesn't carry a lot of aircraft though. But it's fast, you know, and it gives you, you know, it just gives you more stuff. Um, and then you have escort carriers. Now, escort carriers, the British use them to fight U-boats. That's what they're there for, essentially, and protect convoy protection mostly. The Americans will also build escort carriers for convoy protection. However, they will start using them specifically as support for gra for landings like in the philippines okinawa so those escort carriers in particular are giving close air support to ground troops i see japanese escort carriers are essentially ferries for ships for air I'm, I'm sorry for aircraft with get this the army the japanese army had aircraft carriers nice <laughs> Isn't that goofy? It is. <laughs> like, ar Army-operated aircraft carriers to only carry Army aircraft. That's how much the Army and Navy hate each other. 
Yeah, no, the rivalry between the Japanese Army and Navy is pretty unreal. Um, and also, I guess the naval air arm of the Japanese Navy had a lot more prestige than the Army Air Force, right? Yes, generally. Um, there And there was, that's actually, Yamamoto and Tojo hated each other because they had served on a joint board and Yamamoto was really pushing forward lots of innovations with aircraft and the Navy naval air arm was just doing really well in China and better than the Army was. I mean, don't get me wrong, the Army air was doing fine, but the Japanese naval air arm was doing better and there used to be an expression that um, the, you know, the Navy, the Japanese pilots were called the Sea Eagles and they would, ref Japanese public would sometimes refer to um, Navy Eagles and Army Chickens. Huh. Which is wow. unfair in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, the the the, uh, the army itself will have some excellent aircraft later on, um, and I don't actually know enough about the Japanese Army Air Force to say more than that. It's a bit of a hole. I should really look into them more. But I know that at least in the early war, the Navy is considered the best pilot, the better pilots, the better equipment overall, and they're definitely the ones gaining the prestige. I want to say the army got uh, the Raiden and the Frank. Or maybe they only got one of the two, but those more advanced aircraft that were supposed to replace the Zero. Well, yeah, but one of the Army airplanes, uh, I think it was the KI-44, uh, this thing was considered more fragile than the Zero, if you can imagine that. Uh, a lot of U.S. aces were made in the Pacific shooting down Army aircraft in 1943. Yeah, especially um, the P-38 Lightning, which I don't think did very well in Europe, but it reaped out in the Pacific. It did, and uh, Charles Lindbergh flew one of those and uh, shot down some Japanese aircraft. I think he might have even become an ace. I'll have to look that up, though. Wouldn't he have been too old by then? Uh, he was... I had to read up on it again, but you know, Franklin Roosevelt hated him, and he volunteered to help out during the war, and you know, Roosevelt tried to block him, but eventually he was allowed. But he was allowed to go to the Pacific, because they're like, you know, you, you said Hitler was okay, so you can't go to Europe, right? Yeah. And what I believe is that he was like a technical advisor or something, and they allowed him to fly some missions, and he shot down some Japanese aircraft. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, but no, no, he's he's, he's <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a he's a lightning uh, pilot in the Pacific, essentially. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, fun fact. Do you know the name of the leading American ace of all time? No. He had forty-four kills, and his name was Dick Bong. Dick Bong? Dick Bong. He was a P-38 pilot. Well, Can't make shit well, like you know that up. The, well, you know the, the name of the dive bomber pilot who landed the killing blow on the Akagi, right? His that, name was... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, say it. You know it? Uh, I saw the movie Midway, so I, I'm i familiar with the person you're talking about. I cannot remember his name, though. Uh, Dick Best. <laughs> yeah, Dick Best and Dick Bong, the two greatest yeah. heroes of the Pacific. Yeah, no, Dick Best, we were like, we were Joe, we were the thing, we we're like, man, so our hero in this movie is a guy named Dick Best. And then he just told one of the guys, he's like, I'm not doing so well. And then he looks at him and goes like, hey, man, you got to get good. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, the advice of Dick Best is you got to get good. Well. <laughs> All right, man. So uh, at this point, though, the, the, the British have pretty efficient air operations, uh, very good at using their aircraft carriers. The only things that limit them is they don't carry a lot of aircraft. And what aircraft they do carry are not always the best. But still, they're, they're doing well what they have in the Mediterranean. Famously, of course, Yamamoto decides that they're going to attack at Pearl Harbor with six fleet carriers, including the new Shikaku and Zuikaku. Uh, the air raid on Pearl Harbor is a stunning display of what the aircraft carrier can do. Although very soon afterwards, you could never do anything like that again because of radar. You could never catch anybody that unawares. But still, the uh, the attack is, um, from a tactical point of view, a stunning success. Numerous American ships sunk and destroyed, massive casualties inflicted, lots of aircraft destroyed. Um, we probably have to do an entire thing on Pearl Harbor to get the details of it, like, you know, the debates about should the Japanese have launched another strike, or what about bombing the um, the fuel tanks and the rest. Uh, of course, the no carriers were actually at Pearl Harbor, which upset Yamamoto. 
Right. And also should be kept in mind that the battleships that were hit up were, you know, I mean, old dreadnought battleships. I mean, these aren't ships to joke about, though. I mean, they, they packed, you know, they had heavy cannons on them. And there's a good case to be made that the uh, the best battleships of World War One were the American ones. They were really well-designed ships. Uh, but anyway, um, this is a display of what the carrier can do, right? But the bigger one is the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. They sailed out of Singapore to try to attack the Japanese fleet as their landing troops at Malaysia. But there's not enough, they don't, they don't have proper air support, and Japanese land-based bombers catch them in the open and attack them. Um, the the Japanese are lucky in many ways. The the British these two battleships did not well battle one's a battleship one's a battle cruiser Prince of Wales and Repulse Repulse being the battle cruiser. They don't have enough anti aircraft guns. One of the first Japanese hits on Prince of Wales is a crippling hit. Repulse puts up one hell of a fight though. Uh, but both of them are eventually sunk. This this is the truly stunning thing because not only are these two battleships sunk in the open. They have veteran crews, especially Repulse. Repulse had been active throughout World War II. The crew of Repulse is considered one of the best in the Royal Navy. Prince of Wales had only been around less than, half, less than a year, but it had fought the Bismarck. It had an experienced crew. People are shocked that these two ships were sunk with relatively low casualties. Um, and that's really what that's really what settles the debate. The carrier is now the primary weapon. Uh, anyway, so, you know, the Japanese Navy is essentially going to go tear ass and around the Pacific, launching massed carrier strikes wherever they go. Like, they're going to... You know, they actually launched a bigger first wave strike against Darwin, Australia, than they did against Pearl Harbor. Damn. Yeah, it's slightly bigger. Like, like I think like eight aircraft more, but the thing was the Japanese were really perfecting mass carrier strikes. We are causing maximum damage right away. They'll then raid the Indian Ocean. They actually managed to sink the Hermes. Um, they didn't find the main British fleet, though, but everybody's pretty sure if they did, it would have been a slaughter. I think that's uh, a safe bet. Um. Um, the only hope the British would have had is if they had a surface battle, because the Japanese carrier fleet was protected by essentially battle cruisers. And the British, while they're slower... I mean, they and they have, they have the uh, like the the these like um, the war spits and uh, these R class battleships. Like I want to say, oh, who was out there? Royal Sovereign was one of them out there. Um, and those ships, yeah, the Japanese ones are faster, but those ships have heavier, have better armor and better guns. So, you know, a surface battle might have been a dicey thing for the Japanese if that had occurred. But, um, but no, they don't. They. Um, they cause horrendous casualties to what ships. What ships they do find, they sink. They sink a lot of merchant ships. Uh, the Ryojo does a lot of that. And the um, British actually have to abandon the Indian Ocean. Um, the Americans are launching raids on the periphery of the Pacific, and that's gained them some experience, but they're still not particularly quick and efficient with getting their aircraft loft. Now, the Indian Ocean raid very easily could have turned into the first carrier battle. It didn't. Instead, what is going to be is the Battle of the Coral Sea. Uh, in this battle, the Americans lose the Lexington, Japanese lose the light carrier Shoho. Uh, aircraft losses are roughly equal between the two. Very confusing battle. Um, ultimately, an American victory, although one with although one paid at heavy cost, ultimately an American victory. Because, you know, they stop the Japanese from plunging further south. It, it, it interrupts their uh, their attack on Port Moresby. Which, I believe today, Port Moresby is the most dangerous city in the world. Really? You know about this? No. Or, it's one of them. Uh, there, was a, there was a Tim Dillon skit where they, uh, they called, like, the Holiday Inn at Port Moresby. You know? <laughs> to be like... Hey, what if we just want to like leave the hotel and they're like, oh, we don't advise that. <laughs> <laughs> that bad, huh? Yeah. Which makes, but yeah, yeah. Apparently, they're at the Holiday Inn or whatever hotel it is. There has like a wall with like you know machine gun armed guards. <laughs> Holy shit! 
Yeah, who knew, man? Port Moresby, the road warrior of the Pacific, right? The road warrior movie just waiting to happen. <laughs> yeah, what, what country is that in now? Uh, New Guinea. New Guinea, okay. Um, yeah, that's Port Moresby for you, you know? Uh, so you got any uh, observations at this point? Um, not too much. I was hoping uh, when we talk about, I guess we're about to get to Coral Sea in Midway, I was hoping you could elaborate more on the methods that fleet choose to find each other because I found that to be actually the most interesting part of that Midway movie. Okay. Uh, of course you'll try to use um, land-based reconnaissance and seaplane tenders. Um, at this time, searching for ships is not as advanced. The Japanese probably actually have the better one for their carriers. Okay, but they don't. You know that what they call a two two phase search is not is isn't in place yet. Um, Americans would sometimes kind of say like, okay, like we have a spotting from a submarine, or you might sort of be like, okay, we're pretty sure the enemy's in this area, so you launch your strike into that area. And so instead of having a scout aircraft find them, report them in, and then you launch there. Sometimes I wouldn't say it's blind necessarily, but the Americans would sometimes be like, "Okay, we're based on all of our intelligence. We're pretty sure they're there. We're going to launch you there and hope you find them." Um, Japanese, from what I can tell, were a bit more like, "Hey, the scout plane's got to report back and say what's up, and then we'll go from there." Uh, search searching during the Coral, Battle of the Coral Sea was done very poorly by both sides, but eventually they did, you know, sight each other and inflict damage on each other. Um, Identifying ships, of course, is difficult. The Japanese launched a massive strike on an oil tanker, the Nishio, thinking it was a carrier. It wasn't. At the same time, Fletcher launched a massed airstrike on the Japanese landings in the uh, Guadalcanal area, sinking a destroyer. But, you know, he, uh, uh, by doing that, when he alerted the Japanese that there were carrier aircraft in the area. In the case of Midway, of course, the Americans used PBYs to fan out. They eventually, of course, spot the Japanese. Both carrier groups launch attacks because at Midway they're divided between Yorktown, which is Fletcher, Spruance, who has, um, sorry, Enterprise and Hornet. Uh, the Japanese did not spot the Americans soon enough. I want to say one of the aircraft had a radio malfunction, and they never found Enterprise and Hornet. They only found Yorktown. Uh, the Americans, when they when the Japanese would launch an attack, you'd have you know, a large number of aircraft with escorts, which is what they did to Midway. They pummeled Midway. But the Americans would instead, these squadrons would be launched and would attack disjointed. Now, that led to horrendous casualties with the torpedo bombers that first struck the, the Japanese, but it made the Zeros expend their, um, their cannon because um, they had machine guns and cannons. The cannons doing the most damage. So they expanded their cannon ammunition. They scrambled the combat air patrol. So then dauntless dive bombers converge on them. One is a flight coming out of Enterprise. The Hornet flight got lost because Mishner fucked up. <laughs> and then one flight from Yorktown arrived at roughly the same time. In less than five minutes, Soryu... Kaga and Akagi all receive fatal damage. Although maybe Akagi could have been saved, but the problem with Akagi is it was hit in literally the one the the exact spot it did not want to get hit in. Right? Right. But, but Akagi and Soryu are just just blown to pieces. Hit with multiple bombs while they're gearing up to attack. You remember these things are floating gas cans as well. Um Soryu in particular, I mean, Okaga also, they're, they're just, they're just, they just burn up until they eventually sink. Um, Japanese do launch a strike from Hiryu, and their pilots, of course, are top-notch. They manage to do major damage to Yorktown, although Yorktown ends up being sunk by a submarine. Uh, what you see happening at this time is the anti-aircraft gun defenses of the Japanese just aren't enough of them. Now, keep this in mind, too. The Japanese, one of the Japanese doctrines was to try to dodge bombs, to dodge torpedoes. They were actually really good at this. Um, 
and you know Japanese helmsmen during the war for the for the stuff were excellent. However, this had the effect of the Japanese escorts in the fleet were keeping their distance from the carriers to let them have enough movement. Like there's a famous picture of the Hiryu where you can see the Hiryu spinning. It's a great picture. So because the escorts are far away, they can't add their anti-aircraft gun fire to the defense. Whereas the Americans didn't do fancy maneuvers. They're relying on... A, their combat air patrol is not as good as the Japanese, but they do have one. But they're relying on just anti-aircraft gun fire. Which was effective. You know, the, the Americans do do significant damage to the Japanese as they come to attack Yorktown. Uh, but... What you notice is after every battle from midway on, the Americans just add more anti-aircraft guns, more anti-aircraft guns, more anti-aircraft guns. So that becomes a big part of the way they defend. So um, I guess it's kind of comparable to that German critique of the American way of war of you, you guys just keep using more artillery and tanks until you bust through. A bit, yeah. I mean, it, it's also keeping. I mean, we're we're an industrial country that enjoys firepower to this day. Yeah, I mean, so I, I guess so. Of... It it it's a perfectly logical solution to the problem. I mean, if you got more firepower than the other oh, guy, perfect. just blow the shit out of them. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, and I, I mean, and that Japanese method of dodging. Don't get me wrong. It it's it's not like um, it fails at midway at that moment because they are surprised, right? It actually works pretty well in the Philippine Sea. And they dodged a number of hits in other battles as well. So, you know, it's not the best method, but it, I wouldn't call it a wholly inferior method. I would, you know, like, like it, it does get you some results, you know. Uh, the, only, uh, the only carrier that had a decent anti-aircraft gun suite for the Japanese at the time was the Kaga, which did manage to actually blow one of the Dauntlesses out of the air. Uh, Kaga also, like... Um, I want to say the Soryu's anti-aircraft gun gunner, gunners didn't even know it hit them, but the Kaga's gunners actually managed to get a lot of their stuff up and fire. Uh, so in the case of the Americans after Midway, uh, they'll continue to operate their carriers separately. Their carry operations are getting faster, but they're still generally slow. And when I say operations, I mean like getting the aircraft in the air, attacking. Um, but throughout 1942, they're, just, they're improving their anti-aircraft gun defenses. In the case of the Japanese... Uh, besides the fact they will start adding more anti-aircraft guns, um, they also start operating their carrier fleets more divided than before. And also, with four of their fleet carriers gone, they're forced to integrate light carriers like Ryojo, Zuiho, and uh, eventually the Junyo and Hiyo, which the Junyo and Hiyo, you can, you can debate whether or not they're light or heavy. I would almost call them medium carriers, which is a category that doesn't technically exist, but that's kind of what they are because they... They don't have a small air wing, they don't have a large air wing, and they're also not super fast. They're also fairly, they're also not that small carriers, but they're not that big. You know what I mean? It's confusing. All right. Well, I feel like from what you're describing, the Japanese didn't really have carrier classes so much as they just had individual carriers. Mostly, yeah. The, the closest thing to a class would be, of course, Shikaku and then Unrayu, which is the next generation Japanese carriers. And essentially all the Unryus are are improved Hiryus. That is to say, they do carry a decent complement of aircraft, but not a ton. Uh, the Unryus are almost like... What the Japanese are thinking with the Unryu is that we need to be able to build a lot of carriers. So they start going more for a quantity thing, which is why, if you really think about it, it's, not a, it's only an improved Hiryu. If you were really going to make like the next great class of carrier, you'd do an improved Shikaku, because that's an excellent carrier. But they don't have the resources for that, so they go with the Unryu idea instead. Uh, apparently, one of the Unryus was only made when they the Japanese people throughout Japan had to like contribute like 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 pots and pans to get melted down to make the carrier happen. That's that's how desperate things are getting. Man. Um, yeah, as one guy said, well, you know, carriers don't grow on trees, right? Um, well, I guess they don't. Yeah, that, that's, that's the way to look at the Japanese. They, they, the, most of their, what classes they do have are more like pairs, like Shikako Zuikaku, Junyo Hiyo. Um, I've said, Hiryu and Soryu are as, I mean, they, they are separate classes, but they're essentially, they're really close together. So you can, 
kind of you see them as a pair as well. And they did operate together too. Uh, but you know, the Japanese are going to be the Japanese will also start to have a devoted what they do with their carriers as well is that in the Battle of the Eastern Solomons what will happen is the Zuiho which is the light carrier is handling the combat air patrol and constantly putting aircraft up while the Shikaku and Zuikaku are concentrating on the strike that's an improvement which of course, over Midway yeah so the, you know, the Japanese are learning to making improvements as well so okay. the next carrier battle is Eastern Salmons and Santa Cruz. Um, Eastern Salmons, American anti-aircraft gunfire does really well. They eviscerate the Japanese. Um, and the Japanese carriers only manage to just damage the Enterprise. Meanwhile, the light carrier Ryojo is sunk. Um, however, carrier Saratoga gets like taken out of action by a Japanese submarine. And then the Japanese submarine sinks the Wasp. And then you get the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands. Um, this is kind of like Coral Sea in that the Americans suffer heavier casualties overall because they lose the Hornet. However, by that time, our anti-aircraft anti -aircraft gun defenses are so good that the, the Japanese pilots coming back from that were saying things like, this is like nothing we've ever seen before. And Santa Cruz Islands, the pilot losses by that time have piled up so much that the Japanese will not commit their carriers to a major battle again until 1944. Damn. Is this yeah. also the time now, when the U.S. Time, started America... fielding better aircraft on the carriers? Yeah, although we say better, I mean, you know, uh, the Wildcat's good. I mean, it has some problems. It doesn't have a great climb. It's not very maneuverable. But, I mean, if you knew what to do with a Wildcat, a Wildcat will fuck a zero up, you know? The problem, the problem the Allies had in the early months of World War II is the Zero is a good airplane, but more importantly, they were playing the Zero's strength because they were dogfighting it. And you, eventually, people, eventually they said, like, whatever you do, just don't dogfight a Zero. You're not until the Hellcat comes out, right? Right. Now, the, Hel so the Hellcat's broken. The Hellcat's S-tier. Yeah, yeah, Hellcat's amazing. <laughs> yeah, but you know what I'm to say? So... If you if you know what you're doing with a wildcat, yeah, you can take down some zeros. But if you're gonna go dogfight a zero, you're probably getting shot. But by late 1942, we know that, you know. So we're avoiding dogfighting zeros, so the losses are roughly equal. Uh, the Dauntless dive bomber is an excellent piece of equipment, and the Avenger torpedo plane is too. Help! They're using Avengers as late as Vietnam, you know. So. Um, Japanese carrier aircraft, I mean, the, the B-5N Nakajima, good airplane, but it's showing its age. But a, a, good, a good airplane, very versatile. The D-3A Val, uh, very good dive bomber, with, but a bit weak. Like, like, you know, it doesn't take punishment too well. But probably its main drawback is it didn't have as heavy a bomb load. You know. Um, so I'd really say that, you know, the... It wasn't that the Japanese airplanes were significantly superior to ours. It was just that in 1942, they just have better pilots and doctrine. But by the time the Santa Cruz Islands, that's going to be at an end. The really, really terrible thing they do is that after Yamamoto dies, Koga takes over. And by that time, the land-based naval air units have taken horrendous losses. So he actually ha emptied the carriers. He had the carrier crews dispersed to the bases. And then pulls the carriers back to train new crew. This was a major mistake. Those crews went to those bases, and that's where all the experienced pilots will meet their end. And meanwhile, the replacement pilots who are coming in are not going to be the best because they don't have enough training. And uh, while they do have some decent aircraft, uh, God, I'm trying to remember which one it is. Is it the Judy? There was one of them. Um, one of them was like really good. It was very fast, but you know, it trainings everything, right? And even worse than that. Instead of getting a new carrier fighter, all they get is like an improved Zero, the um, A6M5. All right. Which I mean, well, the A6M5 is the best version of a Zero you're gonna get, so it's right. not a terrible airplane. It's just that, like you said, it's going up against the fucking Hellcat. <laughs> yeah, and I think like the speed difference between a Hellcat and a Zero, I want to say it's over a hundred miles per hour max speed. Which, when we're talking about the context of planes that usually started maxing out around 400 
that is a yeah. massive difference in speed to the point where you can't compete at the, if you're only going, say, 290 or whatever. There's an Osprey book that's like, uh, you know, A6M5 versus Hellcat. Yeah. And I've just read the book. All it is is just like, just, you're just like, there's no contest here. I think the, I think the author said, the Zero can still outturn the Hellcat. And that's it. <laughs> but but the Hellcat is so much better than the Wildcat in terms of turning that the advantage it has in outturning it is at best slight. You know. And then everything else, like ability to take hits, firepower, climb, yeah. speed, acceleration, training. Yeah, everything else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think, no, I think that one might have actually still had a better climb. But, you know, one of the big advantages the Zero had, the, the A6M2, the original one, was just the range it has. Amazing range, right? Yeah, because it didn't weigh anything. Right, but that's the thing is, to make the A6M5, M5, they add, like, you know, I don't want to say armor, but it's just better protected. So it can take hits better, but now you've cut the range in half. <laughs> you know, uh, but anyways, so... So anyway, where was I? Yeah, yeah. So the the Americans have improved anti-aircraft guns. By this time, they're using their radar effectively to pick up on the Japanese where they can get there. That means that not only do you have great anti-aircraft guns, anti-aircraft. Now that you have your good anti-aircraft guns, now you can like get a combat air patrol up fast, right? So the Americans are getting good at combat air patrol. They're getting excellent at integrating information, and they're making um, they're 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 improving their defenses. And they're improving their ability to coordinate between ships and aircraft. Here's where the kicker comes in. In 1943, the Americans are so have so few carriers in the Pacific because they're waiting for all the Essex classes and Independence class to come out that the British loaned them the HMS Victorious. Now it's a British crew and everything, but the Victorious is operating with them. And the Victorious, they remember the British are pretty efficient at carrier operations, getting those aircraft up there. The Americans observe that and start adopting British techniques. Once you do that, combined with new aircraft and just how good these new ships are, I mean, it's like, um, it's no contest what's going to happen. So by 1944, the American carrier force is nigh invincible. You know. Uh, the, now, the Japanese, in the meantime, uh, do have some new ships coming out. They did some more conversions, of course, like, you know, for Yuho and Chito, Chaitos. They do do this interesting one called the Taiho. The Taiho um, is based on British designs, and it's their attempt to do an armored flight deck. Although the Taiho doesn't have, like, a massive air wing, but it's bigger than, you know, what the Illustrious would have. Um... By the way, the one quick note on that. By this time, the British have what's called the Indomitable, which is a, a variation of the Illustrious, which could carry more aircraft. So the British themselves were getting better at having larger air wings on their um, fleet carriers as well. But at any rate, uh, you can get the Battle of the Philippine Sea, where it's a perfect it's a perfect hellstorm for the Japanese. They launch a massive airstrike, and it doesn't matter. The Americans have more fighters, better fighters. The radar allows them to detect the Japanese very quickly. And the Japanese who do get through are slaughtered by anti-aircraft gunfire. Yeah, I just realized um, something. The Battle of the Philippine Sea, the Japanese strategy there is basically the Joseph E. Johnston defense strategy of wait until the last possible minute and then just attack. When all hope is lost. Yeah, well, the Japanese... The Japanese were obsessed with the Kante Kessen, you know, a decisive battle, and they drew up this plan. The Japanese plan was this. They were waiting for the, because the Americans were ready to hit the second line of defense, so they're hoping they'll strike, they, they're hoping they're going to strike Palau, because from Palau they can bring in their carriers and a lot of land-based support. Instead they go for the Marianas. Now, the Japanese plan, actually Ozawa, the Japanese carrier commander, had a great overall tactical plan. Launch aircraft from long range. They can then land in the Marianas and then strike again. And one of the problems the Zawa had was that the the commander of the uh, land-based aircraft in Marianas, Katuka, either was lying or overstated how well his men were doing. So Ozawa thought, oh, we're getting our licks in. We might do this. 
Oh, wait. No, we don't. <laughs> but yeah, you got a point there. I mean, the Japanese Navy falling back in 1943, in some ways it's perfectly understandable, but, you know, it's like they're going to gather their strength to fight a battle where the Americans are going to be even stronger than ever before. Right, because, I mean, the the relative gathering of strength does not favor Japan in any way. Yeah. So that's... But once again, those pilot losses were horrendous. The Japanese training program for their pilots wasn't as good either. I mean, their, their, their replacement system was poor. There was also a tendency with the Japanese to not cycle pilots out of the front lines. So these men are being kept at the front lines too long, which means a lot of them are going bonkers, right? And um, the losses are just not being replaced properly. So, And... You know, by, by mid-1943, when the Corsair gets introduced, the F, uh, F-4U. Right. I mean, that along with the P-38, they really start slaughtering Japanese aircraft. So, you know, by uh, summer of 1943, the air war is decisively tilting in our favor. Yeah, and I think somebody in chat mentioned the F-8 Bearcat that came out at the very end. And talk about, oh, a, yeah. talk about a fucking monster of a plane. I mean, when they started the Reno Air Races after World War II, the Bearcat was unbeatable. Uh, even the P-51 yeah. and other known speedsters just got blown out by the F-8. Yeah, no, the Bearcat was a, a bear. <laughs> no, I mean, because uh, somebody was saying, it's too bad the Japanese didn't have to face that. It would not have been... A, I mean, talking about, the Hellcat's not a contest already. Uh, the Bearcat versus anything that the Japanese could put in the air is a joke. Even if the Bearcat had deployed to Europe, I don't think the Germans had anything that could really mess with it except maybe the the jet the me 262 yeah it should be noted though the japanese start getting some good airplanes at the end you know and very small uh, quantities yeah very small quant yep they're, they're having problems man <laughs> <You know>? yeah <laughs> uh, well, i mean one it's, thing that's interesting, as yamamoto it's said they woke a sleeping giant and they did, yeah. they were not a giant well the thing is the one thing that's interesting too with the americans is um by you're getting time again to like nineteen late 1943 with the attack on the Gilbert Islands and especially in 1944, their 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 fleets are operating as separate task forces, but in a much more concentrated way. So they've abandoned the old like you know like oh, only one to two carriers per thing, and now if anything the Americans are also becoming more like the Japanese, which is you launch a massive strike. They call it a Sunday punch which would allow them to launch just massive waves of aircraft at them. Uh, so yeah, American carrier operations by 1944, they've, they've essentially integrated the best of the British and the Japanese systems along with their own experiences. Um, I mean, I know the U.S. Navy right now, of course, is dominant across the world, and, you know, for a decent chunk of the Cold War. By the 1970s, the Soviets are, you know, they got, they got their, especially by the 1980s, the Soviets have their their, uh, their ways to get their licks in, right? But the U.S. Navy at the end of World War II, now that is, I think that's the most dominant naval behemoth that's ever existed. I mean, their gunnery radar was so good. There was a thing they did with the Iowa where the Iowa was going at flank speed, like top speed in a circle, firing its guns at a target and hitting them. That's nuts. Yeah, you told me about that in 1939, they would have thought you were, like, talking about a science fiction novel. Yeah, I mean, I think the U.S. Navy, by the end of World War II, that might be the one naval force that was more dominant than Athens in its prime. Yeah. Because, was I mean, the Royal Navy in its prime? Well, the Royal Navy in its prime was also pretty dominant, but I, the Athenians, uh, they got to the point where most naval powers had to try boarding tactics. They could just shear the oars off another ship and haul it in. Because they could Damn. maneuver that well, so I mean, yeah, that that was that was pure dominance. And there was one battle early in the Peloponnesian War where a small squadron of Athenian triremes managed to capture a larger number of enemy ships. And it got it, it, they were surprised at first; only one ship got away, and then it surprised the rest of them by circling around a merchantman, ramming the other ship, taking it out, and then. Uh, the crews that were about to surrender then rallied and counterattacked, and they won this major battle. I mean, it's just a, a crew quality thing. So even after the disaster in Sicily, when a lot of the Athenian crews were, you know, either freed slaves who were freed because of an emergency, or 
older guys or younger boys. They just had they had enough senior personnel around that even though the Spartans had newer and better ships, the Athenians were still just whipping their asses all over the Aegean. Damn. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, like the Athenian Navy was pretty dominant, but I, I think the U.S. Navy in 1945, probably in relative terms, the most dominant navy of all time. Uh, I do want to say this though. Um, what do you th- in that case? How impressed are you by what Lysander does with the Spartan Navy? Pretty impressed, actually, um, because he did something literally no under no other Spartan could accomplish. Even though the Athenian Navy was pretty reduced by that point and they were fragile, and it only took one defeat, no one else came close to winning one, uh, except Lysander, because he understood naval warfare in a way most Spartans didn't. Because that's the thing about the Spartans, is that for all of their military training and all their focus on military affairs, they really under, only understood how to win big hoplite battles. Uh, it's amazing how intellectually limited a lot of Spartan generals really were. Yeah. Because that's that's that was their only job, and a lot of them were still no better at it than the amateur generals from other systems. Uh, I mean, with the exceptions of like the guys you can name, like Gylippus, Brasidas, Lysander, you would think a, a strictly military state would produce a number of military geniuses, or guys who would at least be incomparably superior to their competition, but they really didn't produce that many guys who are of that caliber. Well, a case can be made, too, that there wasn't um, really, or like, a reason to um, to encourage them to change. If you're really good at something, you'll just keep on doing it, right? Yeah, um, although, I mean, also, they were aware that everybody else was changing things up and that innovations were occurring. They just chose to ignore them. Okay, I mean, it just, I mean, okay, all right, just... You know, because, I mean, that that can take you by surprise, of course. Uh, I think another one, too, that keep in mind is, uh, I could be wrong about this one, but I'd say the first military that actually has an organized system for, like, innovating tactics, strategy, and everything is the Prussians in the mid-1800s. You mean like a... Mean other countries don't innovate. Yeah. You mean like they do it on purpose? I, they I'm not saying... experiment? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Like, yeah, well, they... they... Well, they, they, I mean, they, they had their own war games, which people still play. Um, you know, so they, they developed the idea of, like, the war game as a way to learn uh, how to fight. So I'm not saying, of course, other militaries innovated. Yeah, you right? might be yeah. right about that. The thing about innovations is they would come after disaster. So, for instance, you know, the French do a lot of innovations after the Seven Years' War. But there isn't, like, an integrated system of innovation that I could see. Yeah, and the Romans are the ultimate example of people who were never proactive about any changes. They only made changes (laughs) when they had to. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So, uh, Oh, I do want to mention one. I want to mention one last thing about the uh, carrier stuff before we conclude and then probably answer some Super Chats. Uh, But the last thing I want to mention about the... um, about this is in terms of the battleships. I was mentioning earlier that they're not vulnerable. Famously, of course, both Musashi and Yamato are sunk by carrier aircraft. Uh, should be noted that those two ships took an insane amount of punishment. Um, you know, uh, and the bombs were, um, were the bombs weren't doing much. They're sunk by torpedoes, and we had to put a lot of torpedoes in those two monsters. Um, so. A battleship, if, if, the thing about it is by the time you get to 1944, your average warship has excellent anti-aircraft gun defenses. And so just sinking any kind of warship is going to be much more difficult in 1944 than it was in 1942. And that's of all classes. But the battleship in particular. I mean, Yamato has no air cover and is just being swarmed the entire time. And also it's anti-aircraft gun defense system was essentially knocked out really early in the battle. Um, so whatever its anti-aircraft guns could have done were crippled by that. Um, now, once again, the carrier is superior, but the battleship is not an easy target. Uh, the only other battleship I know of that was sunk in the open by aircraft was the HIA, and that was a battle cruiser that's, after the, that's during the naval battle of Guadalcanal. 
But the difference with the Hia was it was severely damaged and could it was going like five knots an hour, like in a circle. You know, so you know, like like if there's if there's one battleship that's going to be fairly easily sunk by aircraft, it's going to be the Hia. And actually, even then, they had to scuttle the thing. It wasn't technically sunk by aircraft. So, so. From what you were saying earlier about the U.S. carriers who went down, did all of them go down the subs basically? No. Um, well, Hornet was was crippled and abandoned. I want to say the Japanese torpedoed it. Wasp was sunk by submarine. Yorktown was pretty pretty fucked up by the Japs, but the the Japanese. But then um, you know the submarine. I forget the name of it. That one came in and finished it off. The Princeton, which was a light carrier, that was sunk by Japanese aircraft at the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Uh, some escort carriers got sunk by kamikazes. Um, yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's really about it. Yeah, the submarines did. Uh, the submarines also sank one of the um, escort carriers as well. Okay, um, but I, I guess yeah, the, the sub um, still had a better record, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, okay, what's the other one? Yeah, no. But the thing about Japanese submarines is that they have a lot of success in 1942 because our anti-submarine defenses aren't up to snuff and also Japanese sub cruiser are well trained and they were using them as scouts and to attack ships you know um once you get to 1943 this, their submarines have no chance like the Philippine Sea I want to say they sent 20 or 30 submarines against us we sank like 70% of them <laughs> that's abysmal <laughs> yeah I mean uh... yeah because the detection systems are Here's a question I have for you yeah. before we move on. Um, so let's reimagine Pearl Harbor, but this time it's the battleships that are out doing an exercise and the carriers that are in port. So the Japanese attack, the carriers are in port. Uh, let's assume the attack still succeeds. How does the war play out after that? Well, one interesting thing to keep in mind is that if we were out in exercises, there's a good chance those exercises would have been just outside of Pearl Harbor, which means any battleships that the Japanese did sink would have went right to the bottom. So it would have been worse on both ends. Um, the two carriers operating out of Pearl Harbor at the time are Enterprise and Lexington. Remember, Franklin Roosevelt actually doesn't want to fight the Japanese. He wants to fight the Germans. So the better stuff is deployed to the Pacific. Most of the better battleships and, and a lot of the carriers are. So the carriers deployed to the Pacific are Wasp and Ranger, which are kind of the weaker end, but they also have Yorktown Hornet and... Um, oh, Saratoga was around, but Saratoga got hit by the Japanese submarine. You know about that one? <laughs> no. Oh, no, no, it's actually, that's right. But, yeah, Saratoga got hit with the submarine very soon after Pearl Harbor, so that takes that one out again. Yeah, yeah. for some reason, the Saratoga just attracted torpedoes. Uh, so you might sink two carriers in port. Uh, I guess if they're so thoroughly blown to pieces, you have to be, make sure they're thoroughly blown to pieces so they don't get, you know, raised and brought back up. Uh, I think at that point, the Americans very quickly shift just about every carrier they can from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Maybe not Ranger. Ranger was not a good design. Uh, Ranger had a lot of problems. Now, Ranger does fine with its European operations, you know, but um, Ranger would have had a lot of problems in the Pacific. For, um, also, people who were on the Ranger said that it didn't handle the waves of the Pacific very well. But they would have very quickly shifted over, you know, uh, Yorktown Hornet and Wasp would have been shifted over right away. So... Well, Hornet was getting ready. That's right. Hornet wasn't ready yet. But anyway, um, I mean, I guess what it might mean is the Japanese aren't too worried about the Americans, so they may not. There's a possibility that they do concentrate more on the Indian Ocean and taking out the British than they do. Because one of the reasons why the Japanese, when they're there, I mean, they're drubbing the British and then they shift their forces over is because Yamato is like, hey, you know, the Americans still have their carriers. They're, you know, they're they're doing these raids we got to fight the decisive battle now. But if the decisive battle, in your opinion, has already been won, or you've at least inflicted those kind of losses, then maybe you don't shift that way just so fast. 
you know? Right. But I think what it really means that the Japanese are going to be able to do, still able to do a lot of damage, but but one thing to keep in mind, too, is we've cracked their naval code. I mean, all the battle midway is is an ambush. A very successful ambush, right? Now, you got guys like um, John Parshall, who wrote, along with Anthony Tully, Shattered Sword, which is an excellent book. But he's long been of the opinion that Midway is not decisive because the Japanese don't have the production capacity to face off against the Americans, and also their strategic calculus is off. The Americans are going to fight to the death. At the same time, Parshall has argued that even if the Japanese had, say, brought Zuikaku over, they were still going to lose most of their carriers because they weren't going to find Enterprise and Hornet, and their carriers are vulnerable. Uh, I'm not as sold on that. You know, I, I, I think having a fifth carrier there would have been, <laughs> could have been pretty bad for us, you know? And Zuikaku is no pushover. I mean, it's the, uh, it's the best designed Japanese carrier of the war to take some punishment, you know? So, yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, I don't know. I think, I think it would have made it a lot harder for us to launch a counterattack. Most likely. And keeping in mind, the, the, the attack on Guadalcanal, the whole landing was rushed. Uh, one of the nicknames for it was Operation Shoestring. Yeah. Because they barely were able to secure enough logistical support to pull it off. But King insisted that it wasn't enough to just sink the four carriers at Midway and go, we're fine. We had, in his opinion, we had to stay on some kind of offensive to keep the Japanese off balance. And King was correct. You know, because King's thinking was, if we don't strike now, we'll give them time to lick their wounds. We need to hit them now and force a battle. R very risky. You know, Guadalcanal could have fallen. The Japanese could have driven us off, blockaded the island, and forced the First Marine Division to surrender. That was not impossible. But we won you know. because of America. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, there's a. This is one guy made an argument that. You know, before before 1970s, most World War II movies were at the Pacific Theater, not the European Theater. And there's a lot of art debate about why that is. Um, you know, certainly the Holocaust became more of a feature of American thoughts about what history about history about history in the 1970s. That's really when the Holocaust really enters American consciousness. Um, not that it wasn't there before, but it's really entering at that time. And there's a lot of arguments on why that is, but his one case was simply this. He's like, by the time we fight the Germans, it's kind of over, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, now there's not tough fighting to be had, but by the time you land at Normandy, this war is over, kids. But the Japanese, they have the advantage numerically with us for the first year, and we defeat them tactically when they're at their best. And make no mistake about it, Japanese care while well, the Japanese carriers are floating gas cans, they have the better doctrine and the better pilots. You know, I, I still contend that even though Midway is a calculated risk and an ambush and all the rest, and Nimitz apparently was gonna attack even if Yorktown wasn't there because he wanted to get his licks in. But I still contend that uh, we were damn lucky too. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I think one of the flights that went out to attack the Japanese completely missed, right? Yeah, Hornet. Hornet's groups found nothing. A uh, fun fact about that, uh, after the Battle of Midway, Spruance kind of politely told Nimitz, yeah, when you look at the Hornet report, don't believe it, it's a lie. You know. Wow. But M M Mishner, Mishner got better after that, but Mishner really screwed up at Midway. You know. Um, so, yeah, so... Yeah, into World War II, Americans have uh, perfected carrier doctrine, and the aircraft carrier has been uh, a pivotal feature of the Navy ever since. There is a case we made right now, though, that the submarine is probably the new ruler of the oceans. Yeah, no, I think I think you're right about that. Because of the cruise I missile, think... I think the cruise missile has changed naval warfare. Yeah. So, I mean, even if, even if I was going to make the case, like, battleships could have kept going for a while. I don't know what year the cruise missile came out. I'm going to guess 1980. I'm just throwing that out there. At the point where the cruise missile comes out, at that point, the battleship becomes a joke. 
Well, you didn't necessarily need him, like you said, because you don't need him for the gun line. Right. Right. But, I mean, we, when, to be fair, we used the Iowa-class battleships for a while after World War II. And then, of course, used them, brought them back in the 1980s. That's partially because the um, um, the um, the Soviets essentially brought in, like, their kind of, like, battle cruiser. <laughs> um, is that the Kirov, I want to say? You know what I'm talking about? Um, not right offhand, no. Okay. Yeah, I want to say it's the Kirov. I'm going to look this one up, though, real quick. Uh, so, you know, you got to counter the fact that the, that the, uh, the Russians... Yeah, it's a Kirov battlecruiser. Uh, is it still around? A nuclear-powered, missile-guided cruisers of the Soviet Navy. Um, the largest and heaviest surface combat warship in, op in the world. Yeah, it's still around. Yeah, also, uh, back then the term for ships that were nuclear missile first platforms was Boomer. So if you yeah, were to yeah. go back in time and complain about Boomers, people would say, I hear you, brother. I don't want to live in a nuclear apocalypse either. <laughs> <laughs> That's a phrase they use in uh, Hunt for October. They're like, we have another Boomer coming out the barn. Um you know, but yeah, yeah, I mean, the um, the battleship is uh, is not needed, but who knows? I mean, the aircraft carrier has, of course, has its particular uses, but uh, they're, it's looking like they're pretty vulnerable to submarines right now. Yeah, I think what was that story from, it's been a several years now, but the Indian Navy won a, an exercise where they managed to sink a U.S. carrier, and I think the Navy contested the legitimacy of the results, but basically the point is that uh, our defense four carriers might be outdated. Yes. Uh, the Swedes did the same thing in the exercise. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, it, it could be the case that the carrier's now outdated. The other thing, of course, is that the aircraft itself, especially the combat aircraft, arguably is on the cusp of being outdated as well because of drones. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I mean that one's more debatable, but I mean, look, look, drones are dr drones are very effective, but um, you know, in some ways, they're I mean, they're still vulnerable to being shot down themselves, right? Yeah, although I mean, you can put swarms of them up, and they're fairly cheap compared to manned aircraft, because you don't have to have life yeah. support, and you can make them much smaller. Um, but yeah, it's yeah. Um, it's possible that it's kind of like what's that one Call of Duty where they have uh, swarms of drones that just fly at you. I think it's either mm -hmm. Advanced Warfare, one of those. That might actually be the future. We have these drones wow. that are only worth you know a thousand bucks a piece, which by military standards, I mean that's a meaningless expense, uh, and you just send hordes of drones at things. Well, let me go get some um, some water and everything because I was, you know, talking for a while here. All right. And uh, we'll do some concluding remarks and answer the super chats. That sound good? Sounds good to me. Excellent, man. I'll be right back. And once again, YouTube failed to preserve comments as they should. Luckily, I wrote them all down. Yeah, diesel subs are underrated for sure uh, because of how quiet they are. And they also aren't as big, I believe, so they don't have quite the punch. I could be wrong about that, though. Diesel subs could be really good at defending coastal waters, though. Especially if you had a smaller navy and you're not going to try to win naval supremacy, you just want to interrupt the other side's operations. I could see diesel subs being damn useful.
How many cabinets is Sean opening? Hey, yes, it's funny so, because uh, it's I can hear all your cabinets opening, and this is the first time where I've actually been closer to a kitchen area than you are while doing one of these streams. <laughs> so, Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, because I'm right. I'm, I'm in a hotel room, so I'm right next to the little kitchen area and the bathroom as well. So. Yeah. Let me go grab one last thing, and I'm good. All right. Okay. Well, fuck. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a break then. I'll be back in a second, guys. Yeah, sure thing. All right. Oh, we're taking a full break. Maybe Elon Musk can maybe Elon Musk can design an electric submarine for us. Yeah. I'll probably do it to get attention. Or hang out with Amber Heard again, I guess. You know. Yeah. But um. Yeah, I don't know. It's fine to see how the uh, how the drones are going to go. I mean, I mean, they, they there's a lot of potential there, of course, but you know, nothing's going to. You still going to need like men on the ground, and there's no such thing as an invincible weapon system to begin with, you know. So it's all just measure and countermeasure. Um, but you know, I mean, uh, I didn't see Top Gun Maverick, but apparently they have a whole speech in there where they're saying like. You're a dinosaur, Maverick. We don't need, you know, the future is going to be unmanned um, aircraft. All right. I have returned. Okay. So, we've got... Any final thoughts? On carriers. I guess one last thing because I know you've talked about this in the past, but I feel like it might be worthwhile to bring it back up, would be uh, damage control, specifically on aircraft carriers. Because you're talking about, I know mm. you talked about how the U.S. Navy specialized in damage control, whereas, you know, the Japanese were much weaker. Yeah, British also had some issues. So, the way it works is the Japanese had special damage control units. The problem with that is, is that what if these guys get taken out, right? Yeah. And they know what they're doing. So there wasn't much emphasis, and they re relied on specialized crews. Of course, you got a good damage control crew. They can get things underway, certainly. But Japanese ships in particular tend to go, tend to blow up and suffer lots of horrible losses. One of the most interesting of all time is the Battleship of Congo. Um, the damage control crew tried their best. They all died trying to stop the ship from sinking. It took a torpedo hit um, from a submarine. Hmm. The Americans didn't have... The Americans, everybody was trained in damage control. Now, the Americans did, I believe, have some specialized damage control teams, but everybody was trained in something to do. It's also been pointed out that Americans were coming from a culture that was much more mechanical. More of them had worked in factories. Uh, car, you know, car ownership had become big in the 1920s. And so you're talking about people who just had a much more mechanical background than a lot of your average Japanese sailors. Right. Um, British damage control was kind of in between the two, although it was generally good because British... The Royal Navy in World War II, by the way, to me is very... It's kind of interesting because their ship designs, in a lot of ways, overall, are not the best compared to other countries. But they still had incredible training. And even though the ship designs may not always be the best, they're still generally good. It's just that the Americans in particular, but I'd say a lot of the German and Japanese designs are just better, right? But the, the training the Royal Navy is still excellent. And so they're pretty good at handling damage control, but even they would have, like, ridiculous um, things happen. You know, like the loss of the Ark Royal. You know, sunk by one torpedo hit. Something to do with the design of the ship, because the ship didn't have great watertight compartment space in the bottom. Uh, anyway, American damage control, what you see them doing is learning from their mistakes. So the mistakes in with, say, handling fuel and other things that led to the loss of Lexington and Wasp, those are corrected. Oh, Lexington, by the way, that's what I was trying to remember. Lexington is essentially sunk by aircraft as well. So that is one the Japanese definitely get. So that's generally what you can say about 
uh, you know, damage control, I'd say. Hmm. You mentioned one other thing that's just you know, about uh, engineering ships as well. It's interesting to get into, like, you know, the fact that Japanese ships didn't have very good living quarters. Or that German uh, surface warships tend to be over-engineered. You know, uh, but not their submarines. Their submarines weren't over-engineered. But yeah, stuff like that, you know. you get into the, That's when you get into the real nitty-gritty of, like, what these um, different capabilities in the navies and the certain ticks they had. Right. Hmm. Well, are you ready to uh, begin our super chat journey? I'm in. I uh, right. I saved them just in case. Did you? I did. I got all of them. Okay. So first up, we have right, Brian Kim for two dollars, and he says, "Please read me." You've been read, sir. Thank you for your donation. Panama Chong for five dollars. If you're going to KSU, check out Duluth. Great Korean food. Also, y'all need to do a rundown on Yi Soon Sin, arguably the greatest admiral ever. Go Owls. Uh, so, is by Duluth do you mean the town in the Atlanta area, or do you mean a specific restaurant? Because uh, I actually don't know. I haven't. I haven't ventured outside of Kennesaw and Marietta as of yet, so I've actually not been to Atlanta proper or so many other parts of town such as Duluth. So there's a town in Duluth in that area? Yeah, I mean, Al Atlanta itself, I guess, grew out into all of its suburbs in every direction. I think Duluth might be on the east side, but um, I have not been there as of yet yeah <clears throat> well um, okay maybe it's just an area that has a lot of Korean people in it I, I don't know much you know I've been to the Atlanta area since like 2013 yeah one um, thing I'm excited for is they do have a couple of Thai places in town I haven't had a decent Thai place nearby in quite a while actually uh, Columbus usually has pretty much every restaurant you can ask for but one of their weak points is definitely Thai food there was a... What was the best Chinese restaurant in Columbus? In Columbus? Um, I actually never found a really good one there. We had one near where we lived, I guess, uh, called Billy Lee's. And mostly we liked that because it was within walking distance. It, it also had a bar to it. It was pretty cool, but it wasn't elite. <coughs> yeah. There uh, was one that I went to in Columbus that was really good. I'm not oh, yeah? remember, I can't remember the name right now though. Yeah. Um it was kind of out it was more on the outskirts of Columbus though. Huh. Hmm. Also when I had a had a friend when I lived in Columbus, he was from Pakistan and so he sought out a uh, Pakistani restaurant and I don't know the name of it, but he got takeout from there once and I went over and that was really good too. And there's, there's also a lot of good Indian places in Columbus. That's something we really don't have here. We really don't have that here. No, I mean, one of the best uh, things you can find is if you can find an Indian buffet that's open at lunch. That is where it's at. Excellent. Yeah. <coughs> All right. All right, what's uh, our next one? Our next one is from Rio Lobby for Squiggly Thing 50. I don't know what it is, but it is a currency. Thank you, Rhea. And this person just says, love the channel. So thank you for that. Next up, we have Daniel G for $8 Canadian. He says, who do you guys think is the, the best leader for their empire slash kingdom slash country in world history? My pick is Augustus. <coughs> Well, it's definitely a good one for leading you out of a tumultuous period, right? Yeah. You know. Um, I don't know. That's a hard one. Uh, what do you think, huh? I don't know. That is a tough one. I'm trying to think of somebody who stands out clearly above Augustus. I don't know if there's anybody who clearly beats out Augustus. Um, I guess 
one possible contender might be Philip of Macedon. I mean, he really took Macedon from being a second-rate power to being on the verge of world of at the time world conquest. Somebody mentioned Genghis Khan in the chat, I and mean, he's got to be in there too. Um, I think we have a thing where we like, you know, like somebody like Augustus isn't a conqueror; he's a, a consolidator. Stability. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're mentioning like guys who are like you know conquerors, like you know I could. You could say Cyrus the Great would be a candidate. Yeah, or Sargon uh, the Great before him, or a lot of people. Although, you can also make a case for Artaxerxes II. Mm. Uh, in terms of being the best Persian ruler, because he kind of rationalized things in a way that most of his predecessors hadn't. Yeah. So, it's just, it's... Uh, for me, that's just, just so really, really hard. I think for a specific country, it's even difficult then but maybe easier you know so you know I, i'm i'm sorry daniel i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna cop out here i'm gonna say caligula yeah or elagabalus <laughs> i'm going caligula on this one <laughs> yeah i mean caligula was about to give horses greater rights by making his horse consul so um he's got that going for him <laughs> He did. He did. He did. Man, let's not take away from that. Now, I think I think Peta should make Elig uh, make Caligula one of their uh, icons. That'd be amazing. And then do a whole like <laughs> uh, horses should have the right to vote movement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I guess you, there are many possible contenders. Um, Maybe even the Trang sisters from Vietnam. I mean, they repulsed the Chinese and secured Vietnamese independence for centuries. So they could possibly be in the conversation. I guess it depends on what scale you're looking at, too. Um, I have, but, I have a good case for George Washington since he decided not to become a dictator. Yeah. You know? You can make a case for now, Washington on that basis. I know some people will be like, uh, some people might be like, well, he essentially was like a monarch. And I'm like, eh, you know, I mean. I mean, you know, I mean, if you want to stretch your definition of monarchy to where it doesn't, or becomes like meaningless, you know. Yeah, just like how uh, you know Thucydides kind of saw Pericles in that way, to a certain extent. Even though Pericles was democratically elected and everything, but he his influence was such that he pretty much got what he wanted, to the point where, as I pointed out in the video on the Spartan kings, he got what he wanted more often than the kings of Sparta did internally yeah <clears throat> because he was persuasive yeah, i guess i guess what my serious answer and for this question george washington hmm all right augustus is still a tough one to beat i can't really uh i can't i don't know if there's anybody who clearly beats augustus <clears throat> i can, there are definitely some people who are in the conversation but uh yeah. Maybe you could make a case for Peter the Great. <coughs> I don't know. Yeah, I can see that. There's a lot of... There, I mean, there are a few people who could be in that conversation. I guess if you start thinking about more small nations and putting them on the map, uh, you, know, you could probably find some other people who are kind of in that conversation. Um, yeah. But... All right. Well, thank you for the super chat, uh, mm -hmm. Daniel. All right. Next up, we have Taco Cruiser for $5. Why not Taco Aircraft Carrier? Okay, uh, but <laughs> do you think the U.S. is too reliant on aircraft carriers today? How long until aircraft carriers become obsolete like the battleships did? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, it does allow you to like put aircraft up in an area where you normally couldn't, and the way the aircraft carriers are also used, I mean, a lot of times they're used for like humanitarian oh. missions like aid relief. You know, um, <clears throat> so I mean, I, I mean, everything eventually becomes obsolete, right? But um, I don't know. I, you know, I guess if we get into some kind of naval war and we take heavy, heavy losses, there may be a de-emphasis on the aircraft carrier because it is still, at this moment, the centerpiece of our navy. Yeah, literally, the navy is constructed around the ten aircraft bar carrier battle groups. Uh, yeah, every ship is defined by how it defends or supplements the carrier, except for the subs, which are a little bit more free ranging. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> uh, but no, whatever next war happens with the carrier, um, 
pretty sure some subs are going to sink them. So it should also be kept in mind that right now the U.S. Navy is not doing great. Lots of accidents at sea. Uh, bad, poor, uh, you know, uh, not as much recruitment. Um, <clears throat> a lot of officers have been promoted based on their politics. So they're, they're just, the, the, the Navy's, the U.S. Navy right now, you could say is maybe hasn't been this bad a condition since, I don't know, over 100 years maybe? In the Navy, the, <laughs> you can coast on your reputation. Remember, it's not a job, sir. It's an adventure. <laughs> yeah. All right, what's next? All right. Um, in terms of if they will become obsolete, uh, estimate, I mean, like I said, I think the thing that will... Uh, assuming we don't get in the major naval war where the carrier gets exposed badly and those exercises prove to be accurate... Um, the thing that might fuck the aircraft carrier is if the combat aircraft goes the way of the dinosaur. And that could happen within 20 or 30 years if drones take yeah. over completely. Yeah, but then they could just be a drone dispensing device. That's true, although you wouldn't need it to be as elaborate to support drones. So if you're going to build <coughs> replacement ships, you'd build them smaller and faster. Uh, whereas, yeah. I mean, yeah, obviously you're not going to automatically decommission the carriers, but at that point the writing would be on the wall for it, is all I'm saying. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, let's see. Next up, we have Drew Penner for $5 Canadian. Thank you, Drew. And he says, Given events in Taiwan recently, are we going to see a further emphasis of the U.S. military on naval supremacy to counter China or a different emphasis? Uh, what do you think? Uh, <clears throat> I was always afraid that there were too many hawks around Biden. And that after Afghanistan went the way it did, that America felt, like, embarrassed. So, you know, you've got to, like, when the Russians invade Ukraine, you've got to, like, try to destroy them, right? You know, fight your proxy war. And the saber rattling about Taiwan, I actually heard some of it recently. And I, I, I wonder how much of it is hot air. Because we've done lots of finger-wagging with China before. But typically it's just a slap on the wrist. But... If you think about it, each president has escalated the situation with China. You know, Obama was saying, we're going to pivot to Asia, which was code for, let's go contain China, right? right. And then, of course, Trump had his um, tariffs that he put on them and was much more uh, bellicose in his rhetoric. And the sort of stuff that some of the uh, politicians of both parties are saying is concerning to me. And I think the Chinese have, have taken note. You know, so... <clears throat> I think it's going to be I think it's this going to be an increase in naval assets over in that direction. And furthermore, trying to um, strengthen alliances with, you know, Japan, South Korea. So look for more military spending. And keep in mind something else too. Uh, for the last like I wanna say like ten years, uh, Taiwan has been the number one customer for American hard military hardware. Right. You know, so the things have already been ramping up over there anyway. But that's another thing too that these people have no idea about the art of de-escalation. Like, like in the case of Russia, they're treating it like it's like like America essentially is treating it like it's, the American government right now is treating what's happening in Ukraine like we're at war with Russia, without you know sending missiles over. Because by any sane, rational thing, you would try to negotiate something, right? Diplomacy. Right. So if you're not doing that, and you're just you're, you're you're in other words, we're not telling the Russians, hey, if you back down, we'll remove these sanctions. We're not really giving those indications, you know. And this is just ridiculous to me. Well, yeah, but it's also it's also just a sign of how thoroughly the neocons have prevailed in foreign policy debates, to where pretty much any response to something like Ukraine is inherently a neoconservative response. To which I'm like, look. I mean, what's your end game here? You, I mean, I mean, <sighs> sanctions didn't destroy Cuba. They didn't destroy Iran, did they? What makes what makes Russia? I mean, hell, Russia is less dependent than those two countries. And in the case of Iran, it's not like when we put sanctions on that they, you know, that they. I mean, they got around them, right? Iran makes their own cars, for instance. You know. Yeah, I mean, Cuba so, now has the best mechanics in the world. They can fix fucking anything. 
Yeah, I just, the, you know, there's this idea of like, oh, we've cut them off from us, that will just cripple them. I'm like, I'm sorry, man, this stuff is marked. Also, they can go to alternatives. I mean, that's what happened with Saudi Arabia because, you know, Biden was was trying to take a tough stance with Saudi Arabia in uh, 2017, right? Yeah. So what did the Saudis do? Well, they started buying equipment from the Russians. You know? Yeah, <laughs> well, that's the thing, too, is I think the idea of sanctions sometimes has a, uh, a narcissistic element, the idea being that there is no way around uh, dealing with America. I think a lot of the people who talk about American exceptionalism, I think, forget too easily that there was a world before America. And there's a world outside of America. It's possible to make it without dealing with America. Uh, it's harder, but it can be done. I will say this. If we start heavily arming the Taiwanese, like even more so, China will step up their invasion plans, like speed them up. Because um, yeah, I mean, that's essentially what happened in Ukraine was, you know, Trump was arming the Ukrainians, but he wasn't arming them with like some of the best weapons, and they started getting better weapons from Biden, and then magically the Russians decide they're going to invade. I mean, that's not like a coincidence, you know. So, if we start giving the Taiwanese a lot of mil hard military hardware, I mean, the Chinese are going to act accordingly. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the main uh, problem for the Chinese with Taiwan is that they have to get a large force over there intact. That's really the challenge, is the crossing. Yeah. Um, so, to get back to yeah. the original post here, I mean, yeah, I think the U.S. is going to keep increasing the naval presence in the Pacific, especially as the... I guess the Chinese call it the People's Liberation Army Navy continues to grow. Yeah, I don't know. Just which, by the way, I start to feel like is the worst name right? for a navy I've ever heard. <laughs> the absolute worst. What's the best name for a navy I've ever heard? Um, the Royal Navy has a nice ring to it. I mean, the Imperial Fleet sounds pretty cool. My favorites is the uh, German World War One, the High Seas Fleet. Yeah, it's not bad. That's pretty good. And, that's not bad. And the Japanese one is the Combined Fleet. Yeah, all those are fine. But the yeah. Army Navy, uh, the People's Liberation <laughs> Army Navy, I mean, I, that just, that doesn't really go. That doesn't work. Yeah. <clears throat> ah, no, I'm starting to think war's going to be inevitable. You know, so hooray. Yeah, well, I guess one good thing about that, well, not good, but I guess good for me personally is uh, about a week ago I just had a birthday, so I'm now officially too old for the draft. Okay. So, well, at least I well, won't I mean, get dragged into it nukes, personally. Which one if the nukes will fly, and then you got the semiconductors that come out of Taiwan? I mean. The, 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 I just want to say this, man. The, the, Joe Biden and his people, and just politicians in America in general right now, are the absolute worst at the art of de-escalation. Literally every Cold War president is superior to them. All of them. Yes. Um, that's the thing, too, is just... It never ceases to amaze me how incompetent the people in charge are. And this has been true, especially since 2000. I mean, it been a never-ending clown show for the most part. I mean, Obama was the only person who seemed somewhat competent in a general sense, even if he had some bad ideas. But, I mean, beyond yeah. that, I, these other people, not only do they have bad ideas, they're also just <coughs> stupid. I'll tell you what Obama was good at, de-escalation. Yeah. I mean, you know? Of course, they'd blame him and say, like, well, he should have taken the stuff, tough stance against... Russia in 2000, tougher sense as Russia in 2014, or he should have pivoted to Asia faster. And I'm like, all right, dude, I'm sorry, this is not World War II again. You know, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping are not like trying to create the Japanese co-prosperity sphere or the Third Reich here. Okay, I mean, these are these are bad people, but you know, not everybody's like Hitler and Tojo. All right, can we stop thinking that everybody is Hitler, please, please, please? God, we sound like morons. Well, you know, uh, if you only know Hitler, and he's the only reference you have historically, you're just going to keep playing the Hitler card. Yeah, I like what one guy said. He's like, 
you know, it's a Russian leader invading Ukraine, and we're still calling him Hitler. We have Stalin sitting right there. Yeah, no, Stalin, the one of the other very well-known historical figures that most people understand. He's uh, right there, guys. And I mean, another one you could possibly pull up. If you're trying to pull up well-known dictators. I mean, there's Mao Zedong, Mussolini. I mean, these are all people who are well-known enough, even today, that you could use them as an example of something. Nope, gotta go to Mustache Man. Yep, gotta go only to Hitler. No one else gets mentioned or hell you could talk about I don't know Tojo or the Emperor I mean even still that's well known enough to work even if you're talking to a news audience on cable uh, they'll still probably kind of know what you mean yeah alright what's next next up we have Juan Sibley for four ninety nine. thank you Juan he says executives betting if they can make Seagal a star is like the plot line to trading places yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah, that's one of those yeah, things where one. I hope it's true. I don't know if it is. Uh, the thing I forgot to mention about Delano, and I might have him on sometime because he's an interesting guy, uh, is that he tends to believe a lot of stories that I would not. Um, including, like, he believes in a number of conspiracy theories. Uh, well, things I would call conspiracy theories. I guess he would contest that label. But, um... Anyway, so I guess I, I have a uh, more stringent standard of proof <laughs> for a lot of things. Yeah, I'll say one thing, too. Um, apparently, this happened in the 1970s in music with Peter Frampton. Is there was a record, It was the kind of guy who was like, 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 before that, bands weren't too heavily advertised. Like, I think the first rock band to have, like, a billboard made for themselves was The Doors, which is now... Where they did that's become like a standard thing. But anyway, uh, somebody apparently said, like, yeah, I can take a mediocre guitarist, and if I advertise him well enough, we'll make him a star. You know? This, uh, you know, Peter Frampton, Frampton comes alive. It's it's pretty it's pretty blah stuff, you know? But records sold a lot, and that right after that is when record companies shifted their model from you'd sign a bunch of acts, throw them out there and see who caught, to instead you sign a limited number and you create them. Like you create their thing with their 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 popularity through advertising and everything, you know. Uh, older system is vastly superior, by the way. Yeah, it's it's also interesting to me because um, I know my sister, who at one point was really in the music and once started her own band. Her idea of what what made a good musician was, I guess, different than most people's because she was th- basing it almost entirely on uh, pure technical ability. Because she said, therefore, the Beatles are shit. Because, you know, they their music is not that hard to play. They can't be that skilled. Whereas I would think, well, they made really catchy tunes that people have loved for decades, so they must know what the fuck they're doing. Uh, and also, when she found that I had a YouTube channel that was semi-successful, she was also mad because she's like, well, you don't... I mean, where are the production values? Where's the technical stuff? I mean, that's what she really focuses on, because she uh, is really into editing and things like that. Pete Townsend um, said that about the Beatles. He said that um, uh, if you, he said that he said their whole thing was their was their vocals were really good. If you took those out, the music itself was really boring. You know, did you? I mean, I don't know though. Is your sister a fan of Rush? I don't know. If she'd know what that is. She's more into uh, 2010s and beyond. Uh, I guess alternative. Not. Uh, I don't know what it's called, but I keep wanting to say post-apocalyptic metal but i don't think uh i don't think it's what it's called but it's post hardcore it, there's a sub genre she's really into i cannot remember the name of it but it's not all that popular it's actually pretty good though i'll give her that um okay yeah but anyway she was she was horrified i think when she first found my channel and i think at the time i had 20,000 or so subs and she was like how in the fuck do you have more subs than i do <laughs> That's funny, man. Yeah. Yeah, no, Rush. I mean, you've heard Rush before, though, right? Yeah, Rush, uh, the Canadian band. Yeah, they're pretty good. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan. It's too. I mean, they got a few good songs here and there, but it's it's way too technical. Uh, used to be friends with somebody named Helen, and uh, me and her really didn't like Rush, and we were like, yeah, it's music. It's it's. She was like, 
Uh, yeah, that's what that's what I said. I said to her, I was like, yeah, Rush is what you play when you like don't want to get laid. And she's like, yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> my I guess most of what I know about Rush is due to Trailer Park Boys because of course they're Canadian and uh, you know it was Bubbles' that's favorite my, band. Uh, of course it would be. Uh, that was my my thing. I actually I, I like I like the Rush references in in that because it made sense and. Uh, Aquajin Hunger Force uh, Rush shows up in that. that. That was actually pretty funny, you know, but so does Chicago. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, also, I mean, to be fair, from what little I've seen of the guys in Rush, because I think I've said on many occasions that I don't usually know the people in bands too well, but I mean, the guys that they had appear on that episode, they seem to have, you know, a sense of humor about themselves. And, that's I mean, good. They seem like pretty decent guys, so. Yeah, in that case, since you don't know much of guys in bands, I will say Pete Townsend is the guitarist for The Who, just so that's known. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So, so you know, Beatles contemporary. Um, <laughs> what's our next one? Our next one comes to us from Bodie Gatling, which is a very appropriate username for today. Five dollars. Thank yeah. you, Bodie. He says, thoughts on geopolitical analyst Peter Zihan and his latest books. As well, thoughts on his bullish U.S. and bearish China views. I know who Peter Zihan is, but I can't say I've really paid much attention to him. Uh, what do you think about Peter Zihan? Uh, Peter Zihan watched some of his videos. I think they're, I think they're good. He's worth listening to. Um, I would say that he's a bit of a geographic determinist, um, which you know, I I mean, and you know, demographics or destiny type, and both those do have their points. I would say that the main flaw is that, you know, American leadership is, like, really incompetent, and there's no system in place to make it less incompetent. And, you know, we can go over a whole legion of countries in history that had a lot of geographic and even demographic advantages and flush them down the toilet due to morons being in charge. You know? Yeah. Now, what I would say is, and what I think what he would say too, and he can be right, is an example of a country that suffered from that was the Bourbon French. The Bourbon French monarchs and their, their, their nobles, while they had been effective under Louis XIV, were bumbling idiots under Louis XV, at least by the time of the Seven Years' War, and it's still pretty bad even going into Louis XVI. So the French Revolution happens. And because France does at that time have strong demographics and a good economy, because it's it has these strengths, it's able to come roaring back through the French Revolutionary Wars and into Napoleon. But even then, consider that. Napoleon, ultimately, is a great leader up to a point, and when he starts to fail, he fails very badly. And this doesn't go well for France. So, you know, in some ways, shouldn't France... France could have become the power of that age, but it didn't happen. I mean, they were one of the powers, but not the British are the ones who are going to be the winners of that contest. And I don't think British victory was ordained or anything. You know, I mean, right. Britain had some major advantages. You know, and Britain, uh, you know, Britain had its share of problems too. But um, you know, one thing I can say about British nobles is uh, the French nobles were a bunch of top tax dodgers. The British nobles weren't. <laughs> I think that helped out in that regard. You know, clay a lot less resentment. And the British so, nobles also were typically willing to serve in the military and put their lives on the line on a pretty regular basis too. If, uh, fairly so. A, a lot of the French ones did, too. I mean, you know, there was this whole idea of, like, you know, like, you got to be an officer and everything. I think what happened with the French, though, was um, their, their nobles were still generals, but they were, like, you know, having lunch and stuff. I, well, I say having lunch. There's a battle. I think it was Battle Crefeld. Uh, There's, like, an allied force, like, you know, some Prussians. I think there might be some British units in there. And they routed a French army. And apparently the French commander, like, they, they were reporting and saying, like, hey, we, you know, the, the enemy's moving around. He's like, hey, man, I'm eating lunch and drinking wine here, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, they, these guys are trying to be soldiers. They still want to be fops, right? Um, right. So, you know, yeah, just like, I mean, the, the French leadership in the Seven Years' War might be, for a major country, the bottom of the barrel of the 1700s. I mean, a lot of incompetency going on. Um so I, you know, like I mean, a lot of British nobles didn't really do the whole military service thing, and of course, a lot of them were also just like you know, I mean, um, this whole argument of the Victorian age is just people looking at their parents 
you know, gambling, drinking, and fucking, and going, can we, like, not do this, right? Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I think he's got good stuff there, but I think he might rely a little too much on that. Um, his bearish views on China, he does have a point there. However, at the same time, China does have certain particular strengths, and it, it's hard to gauge how good their military would be in a fight. We don't know. You know, uh, the Chinese do have their own problems with corruption and incompetence, but I would say overall their leadership appears to be more competent than ours. But the bar here is really low, everybody. It's really low. Yeah, um, <laughs> I still occasionally see people who don't realize how incompetent some of our leaders are. And at this point, I really can't talk with uh, people who are partisan party supporters because some of the things that they say and believe are just too outlandish. I, I can't have a polite conversation with them because I'll laugh in their faces. So, Yeah, well, you know, there's this idea that if we only get rid of those wascally Republicans or those wascally Democrats, then everything will be fine. Yeah, and then uh, everything will be fine. The leaders on one side are purely good people very competent, very accomplished, and uh, all the information about them that seems negative is purely a lie. They're actually really good at their jobs and extremely intelligent. And if we only gave them full control of the government, then they would fix all our problems overnight and everything would be great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I'd recommend anybody look at Zahan's videos. Just know that I think with anything that that's big, read other stuff, consider other stuff. He's worth it. But, I mean, some of his analysis of uh, the Ukraine situation has not been the best, I'd say. No. Uh, although he's been better than... Although, although I'll also say that he's been better than most. So, yeah, check him out. Yeah, and I mean, I guess it's worth saying, too, that when it comes to predictions, it's... I think there's sometimes a temptation to dismiss anybody who got a prediction wrong. At the same time, we have to remember, especially when you're going into a war, that and you haven't fought a war in a long time, that uh, it's pretty easy to call that wrong. Uh, I mean, for instance, no one knew exactly what the Ukrainian or Russian military was capable of, because they hadn't really been tested in a meaningful sense. And based on previous experience 2014, it was easy to just think uh, Ukraine was going to fold well, they I mean, we, sent in, we sent in NATO equipment and advisors under Trump yeah. so. I mean, we also sent in uh, top notch equipment to the uh, Afghani army and look how that went that's, uh, that's different though I mean getting to why Ukraine military has done better than expected would be a whole other thing but at the same time, what it would appear to me is that, well, everybody gloated and said, ha-ha, Russia's a joke. And I'm like, well, um, uh, some certain mistakes were made, especially with combined arms stuff. But as it currently stands, they are the ones gaining the territory, and so far it appears inflicting the heavier losses. So, you know, um, um, yeah. So, no, no, the stuff he got, the stuff I would say got wrong is, uh, I think he way overstates Russia's strategic aims here. You know? Yeah, uh, that's, that's where I think his mis that that's where I think his his mistake is. Yeah, I guess too we have to consider too uh, that given how poorly Russia's done tactically, uh, the, it's possible they had greater aims at one point, and after the war got going, they might have cut those expectations down <clears throat> quite a bit. They might have. We're never going to know exactly. Their stated aims were the Donbass. That was their stated aim. That's the only thing we can confirm one hundred percent. Uh, the problem we're always going to have is those Russian archives are locked up. You know? Yep. So, I mean, hell, you know, like, uh, we, we weren't even able to go through all the Soviet documents we could, because, you know, in the 90s we could when everything was opened up, and then you start getting this great work on the Red Army during World War II, and yeah, they're, they, you know, they got locked up years ago, so, you know, once again, I mean, it doesn't mean you can't do new or exciting scholarship on the Eastern Front, it just means that you know, the the, 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 the the days of the 1990s, those are over, and they are probably never coming back again. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous to think that keeping the secrets of the 1940s is going to help you in the 2020s. 
I, mean, I think just... it is when so much of your national myth right now is caught up in World War II. Or as they would call it, the Great Patriotic War. Yeah, even bigger than the other Patriotic War, the one against Napoleon, right? Yeah. Yeah. The Great Patriotic War, as opposed to merely the Patriotic War, which was special until it wasn't. Well, I mean, hell, I mean, let's look at World War II America. We have this mythological view of it, right? But what if you wrote, like, a tell-all book about, you know, the racism in the U.S. Army, fire bombings in Germany and Japan, um, oh, the fact that they were having recruitment problems? You know, we look at this idea as, like, everybody joined up. No, we did a draft. Almost everybody who fought in that war was drafted. Also, I think uh, part of that myth of everybody joined up and everybody was happy to be there a lot of that is based on the post 9/11 support for the military because I can remember, as you know, the son of a military officer. Before 9/11, people often poked fun at soldiers and people who were in the military. That was actually mm-hmm. very common, and the idea okay. is that you had to join up because you weren't smart enough to do anything else. Yes. Um, so, like, this, all this whole, this thing about, oh, yeah, you know, back in the day, uh, everybody was super patriotic and wanted to serve. Bullshit. That was not the case. A, well, here's a big one for you. I mean, most of the men who joined up, like, early after Pearl Harbor were unemployed. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, <laughs> they figured this was their best option. And I imagine, too, when soldiers after the war talking about why they signed up, they had the benefit of knowing how the war went. So when they're doing those interviews, they can say, well, I wanted to serve my country and uh, wanted to do my part. And maybe they did feel that, but they probably also had other ideas like, well, you know, I'm unemployed and I'll probably get drafted anyway, so fuck it, I guess. Well, I mean, what do you think helped Confederate recruitment in New Orleans? A lot of unemployed dock workers. They form whole regiments around here, you know? Yeah. Uh, And they got a job. Yeah, that's a thing to point out, too. We do have the records on that, that, you know, the the U.S. soldier of World War II is, is actually been termed a non-ideological soldier. That, sure, he's generally patriotic, right? And he knows the Germans and the Japanese are bad guys, but they weren't particularly ideological, you know? Um, and so they, they have studies on that, which also influenced the way Civil War soldiers were studied for a period of time with books like, uh, like um, Bella Rovell... Um, the uh, Wiley series, um, The Life of Johnny Red and The Life of Billy Yank. Right. Good books, by the way. Um, so anyways, um, no what's doubt. our next one? Uh, next one comes to us from KV for $10, and there's no comment. Thank you, KV. I will assume, until told otherwise, that KV stands for Clement Voroshilov. Yeah, I was thinking of the KV, uh, the KV tank there. You know? Which was named after... Clement, Clement. Voroshilov. Exactly. So we're, I guess we were actually thinking the same thing. We were. <laughs> Just from different angles. Because, you know, the tank actually worked. Uh, all right. The KV-1 was it, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, the KV, uh, KV-1 was a fine machine, as was the KV-85, even if it got overshadowed. Uh, next up we have Magister Militum per Occidens for one ninety nine. Thank you, sir. And he says, America's best torpedo bomber pilot, Dick Hardy. Just kidding. (laughs) Although that would be appropriate. Yeah, apparently, uh, I wonder how many people at the time chuckled when they heard that the hero of Midway was Dick Best and that the leading American ace of all time is now a man named Dick Bong. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Although, I don't know, did people use the term bong at that point, or was that something that came about a little later? I don't... Uh, that would have... No, I mean, these... I mean, you know, like, marijuana was um, not that prevalent. Bongs probably weren't being used much. More importantly, I mean, uh, I think I think they would have laughed anyway, because bong does sound... just sounds like a goofy name, you know? Yeah, although it's also funny, we also have that image of the wholesome American serviceman, but uh, clearly... Back then, there was a lot of profanity, and the British famously said of American servicemen, they're oversexed and over here. Well, I don't yeah. remember how exactly how it went, but the point is that uh, your grandpa or great grandpa who fought in World War II was not necessarily the most pious 
a purely patriotic person in the world. I mean, he also liked to fuck, gamble, and drink. Some of them did. He just leaves that part out of the story for obvious reasons. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I mean, yeah. Um, Anyway, so, um, what's our next one? Our next one is from Sam Reynolds, 1999. Thank you, Sam. And he says, How badly would the battle have gone for us if our carriers found the Japanese, or likewise, after the attack on Pearl Harbor? And where do you think the Graf Zeppelin would have sunk? In port or just outside? (laughs) Uh, The Graf Zeppelin would have sunk outside of port. Probably somewhere in the Baltic. You know? Um... You know, fighting the uh, Russians, I guess. Because by the time the Gra- by the time the Graf Zeppelin's ready, I mean, what's it really going to do? I mean, I guess it could have got deployed to Norway, but by that time, we by 1944, we're raiding the Norwegian ports pretty consistently. So it probably would have sunk in port the way Turpin sank. Um, the other one says, how badly would the battle have gone for us if our carries from the Japanese or likewise after the attack on Pearl Harbor? I, I don't know which battle he means in particular. So I guess maybe he means uh, if... Yamamoto's group had found the carriers that were out doing their exercise uh, say December 10th or 11th or just a little bit after Pearl Harbor. So enough time that the carriers know they're at war, but not enough time for them to really meaningfully regroup or anything like that. So I'm thinking that's probably what he means. Hmm. So I gotta read this. How badly would the battle and this, do you think it's Pearl Harbor or Midway? Um, actually, I, I'm assuming he means Pearl oh, Harbor I mean, because Pearl Harbor. I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, by no, midway we were both seeking battle. So, how badly would Pearl Harbor have gone for us if our carriers from the Japanese, or likewise after the attack on Pearl Harbor? Uh, if our carriers find the Japanese, they're going to report back to base. That's going to be ready. A strike will be launched. The Japanese may not exactly see it coming, but they do have a combat air patrol going uh, throughout Pearl Harbor, which. In some ways, you got to feel bad for those pilots, right? Because you're like a fighter pilot, like, yeah, man, you, you, all my comrades could go, like, be involved in this mass raid, and I'm just guarding the carriers, right? But it's an important mission. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a, th- that, that's been said before, is that we would have, we could have launched an attack, maybe had some success, but our carry operations really are, I mean, you know, that our carry operations have problems by the time you get to midway but we've made improvements because we've gotten experience raiding like the Marshall Islands for instance um, the Japanese then though would have to find us so if they find them before Pearl Harbor the Japanese attack has been scrambled they don't have any surprise they may not even strike Pearl Harbor itself okay um, if it happens after the attack on Pearl Harbor I mean the Japanese may try to the Japanese are either they they we may inflict some damage on them. We may even sink a ship. The Japanese are probably just going to try to get away at that point. But Nagumo, if he does want to du- duke it out, ah, uh, we're screwed. <laughs> you only have you only have two carriers in the area, and both of them are operating um, in uh, separate groups. And by the way, there was almost a carrier battle at Wake Island. The uh, Japanese sent two carriers to assist in taking the uh, island, Hiryu and Soryu. Fletcher was leading the Saratoga in uh, to try to save Wake Island, and then that mission was canceled. Uh, anyways, there might have been a carrier battle right then and there. Uh, and I think in that case, uh, that would have been pretty bad for us as well. Outnumbered two to one, and once again, our carrier operations aren't quite up to snuff, you know? So, so Sean, yeah, are you I mean, telling me you don't, you don't believe in America? Have you not seen the stars and stripes fluttering in the breeze? Do you not know the Maybe. power of Hulkamania? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm not thinking of that scene in the uh, Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. Remember when he, he gets on top of the building, there's like the big American flag behind him? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, yeah, I think it is worth noting that... Uh, yeah, as we said earlier about Midway, a lot of that did boil down to luck. So... I mean, well-planned ambush, no doubt about it. Well-planned ambush and some luck. Yeah, Yeah. luck's Um, always involved, you know. Um, 
I'd say one of the biggest things. I'd say one of the biggest parts of uh, luck in Midway is the fact that Yorktown. I'm sorry. The yeah, Yorktown Enterprises um, dive bombers arrive at the same time. You know. Yeah. That's that's some good luck for us. All right, what we got next? All right, um, Drew Penner, five dollars Canadian. Thank you, sir. He says, since you guys opened the Carrier Hollywood discussion, Maverick or Iceman? I have a very strong opinion on this, but I'll let you go first. Uh, neither goose. <laughs> yeah. Well, see, I, so I was rewatching the original Top Gun before I went to see the movie and th- the new movie in theaters. And the last time I saw Top Gun, I was a kid, so of course I thought, well, Maverick is obviously the good guy because rules are dumb, and uh, you know these guys didn't know what they were doing. Maverick was clearly the man. But watching it now, I realize Iceman is the good guy in this in the movie. Maverick is a dick, except put, for his like little like mouth thing, right, where he goes, you know what I'm talking about, where he tries like he does a little bite motion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so Maverick is the antagonist. Maverick's the guy fucking with everybody else. He's thinks he's a hot shot because he got a kill, and he's trying to undermine what's going on at Top Gun. He's also putting people in danger by not observing the ceiling and all that. And when Iceman confronts him, even though Iceman comes off as a little bit douchey, he's not wrong about what he's saying. He's not incorrect. Because if you're doing training exercises, you should not be putting people's lives at risk in that scenario because they're at peace and during the context of the movie. Uh, and yeah, that, you're right. No, and that's why like, Iceman, it makes sense later on he becomes the fleet admiral because this guy follows the rules, he's very good at what he does, and he seems to have kind of a cool intellectual detachment uh, where he sees that you know the fighters play a role within a larger navy. Whereas Maverick is always thinking about, I just want to go fast, turn and burn, and kick ass. Uh, so you get to the <laughs> second movie. Of course, Iceman's an admiral. He's still, uh, Maverick's still a captain. But Maverick, his larger, um, it, some of his flaws have been sort of weathered down a bit by age. So he's not, he's a much nicer person. And at the same time, now his risk-taking makes more sense because he's about to lead people on a suicide mission. So at that point, disobeying the rules makes a hell of a lot more sense. And, yeah, he's pushing people to a limit. These are all people who have graduated Top Gun already, so these are all proven fighter pilots rather than guys who just have potential. So putting them in dangerous situations is not as crazy. Um, And also... Speaking of Iceman, another defense of the guy, it the second movie also reinforces the idea that even though he comes across as a bit of a dick, he's actually a pretty cool guy because he knows his friend Maverick has some rough spots, but he's defended him and kept him in service because he knows he's useful. And he, he's given him cover for many years. So actually, yeah, I think uh, in retrospect, Iceman is a great man. <laughs> Admiral, whatever the fuck his name was, his last name, the complicated Polish name with a K, was a great man. You heard here for first, Iceman is a great man. Well, he was. I mean, uh, he's exactly what you would look for in a professional officer. So, especially for Hollywood standards, I'm actually surprised by how somewhat realistic they made him. I mean, yeah, to be a fighter pilot, you got to be cocky as hell. But at the same time, you also, if you're going to be promoted to high rank you have to be cool you have to be fair because I mean Iceman never tries to deny Maverick credit for what he accomplished uh, and he never really insulted him on a personal level I mean if you rewatch the movie he doesn't bully him I mean I had that impression when I was a kid watching it but that's not what happens he just says yeah, hey I- can you stop putting our lives on the line like a fucking asshole and it's a reasonable yeah. request <laughs> I noticed that when I, I... I actually never saw it until, like, 2013 or 14 is when I finally saw it. Uh, I've seen Parks as a kid, but yeah, I was always kind of, like, bored watching it, you know? <laughs> um, I thought Top Gun was a... I haven't seen the second one here. It's good. Uh, I, I thought it was a, Top Gun was a solid film, but I kind of picked up on that. I was like, I was like, Iceman's a little bit of a dick, but he's not wrong. No, and the thing is, too, also the, the jokes about the 
homoerotic volleyball scenes, that is not a very big part of the movie either. Um, if anything, there's a lot more, uh, you know, Maverick fucks the teacher scenes. Probably like 10 to 1 ratio. Uh, yeah, definitely. With uh, with that song by Berlin playing. Uh, Take, Take My, my breath, breath Away. With like the little, uh, what's that instrument they overused in the 80s? Uh, not instrument, but a synthesizer. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. It looks like dun, 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 dun. yeah. <laughs> and uh, also, that's the most unrealistic. That's the worst part of the movie, in my opinion, is the love connection between Charlie and Maverick, because he's a complete dick. He's moody. He chases her down. He acts. He acts in a way where, in real life, there's no way he's getting laid acting like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's no way. Even if he has an air to air kill, he's not getting laid acting like that. Oh, there's a lot of that, like The Graduate. I mean, he's just, like, you watch The Graduate, uh, the way he pursues Mrs. Robinson's daughter is totally creepy. I remember watching it years back, and I was like, this guy's a creeper. Yeah, whereas whereas in the sequel, he does seem like a guy who would get laid. So, again, like, Maverick improves over time. Yeah, most people I know are just saying that the second one's better. Oh, it definitely is better. No, there's no doubt about that. The um, question is, are we going to get another Top Gun NES game out of this? It's possible. I mean, they do make they do make retro games for NES and even Genesis. Actually, the Genesis aftermarket is pretty active. Uh, yeah. There are quite a few games. Somebody's making a new port of Final Fight for Genesis now. Nice. And there's also a new a new port that's pretty close to the arcade of Mortal Kombat 2. Cool. Yeah, so uh, the Genesis scene's active. There's also a Russian developer making Resident Evil for Genesis. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot going on in that retro scene. I think it's because they have a dev kit that got released for Genesis not too long ago, and people have been working on it. Uh, but also, the mission in Top Gun 2, if you think about it, if you think about it too carefully, doesn't make that much sense. Um, but even though, if you think about even if you just accept it at face value, it's a good movie. If you think about it too analytically, it kind of falls apart a little bit. So if you're going to watch Top Gun 2, just go into it a little bit brain neutral when it comes to strategy and what you would do militarily. Because well, it, I think- to create tension, they have to create the, the illusion that America is at a disadvantage uh, in terms of aircraft technology vis-a-vis this like rogue nation, which is laughable but uh at least it creates tension pretty well yeah i mean that's gonna be like i mean yeah people are gonna pick up nitpick about those things and i don't want to be on the other side of it because yeah movies will have stupid stuff you should call them out for i think it's when it gets to be accumulate but more importantly when a movie violates its own rules that's the worst yeah yeah um well, our next super chat is from Taco Cruiser for five dollars. Thank you, Taco, or Michael, whatever you prefer. In terms of both size and quality, was the Athenian Navy circa 430 BC on par with the Carthaginian Navy circa 264 BC? Um, so here, I would say the Athenian Navy in 430 is miles beyond. The Carthaginian Navy of 264 in terms of skill. It's not comparable at all. The Carthaginian Navy obviously was defeated early on and lost its qualitative advantage, but they might not have been that great because, again, they're using boarding tactics primarily. Hmm. And the difference in skill between being able to do boarding tactics and being able to ram and get out. That is a, a massive difference because if you want to ram successfully, you have to go at kind of a medium speed and then back out quickly. So you leave the other ship disabled and you can go capture it later. So that's how the Athenians kept their ship sheds full because they did a lot of a high op tempo. So they lost a number of ships to storms and other things, but they replaced them with ships they captured. Um, so that's how they did it: is they put a hole in those that wouldn't sink them but would disable them. And then captured them, brought them back to port. They had uh, resources to repair them. So yeah, uh, the Carthaginians, to the best of my knowledge, could not do that at any point. So uh, the one advantage Carthage would have, though, is that they had bigger ships by that time, more advanced ships. But even so, 
if you had the prime Athenian navy versus the Carthaginian navy, despite the advancement to the Quinquireme, I think the Athenians might still manage to pull it out, just because of that superior skill, and because they would use their smaller, more maneuverable ships to shear the oars. But, I don't know, that would be an interesting matchup, to try a, a very high quality trireme fleet versus a fleet of superior ships with worse crews. Actually, that would be a that'd be a fun sim if somebody knows how to do that on a naval simulator. I'd love to see that play out. All right. Next up, we have Oraz for five dollars, and he says simply, "It would suck to be on a sub that gets hit." I cannot argue with that. It would definitely suck to be on yeah. a sub that gets hit. Yeah, you know, for evidence, just watch DOS boot, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, even if you don't end up dying, that would still suck pretty damn bad. Oh, yeah. Uh, next up, we have Drew Penner for $5 Canadian. He says, thanks for the answer, guys. Hope you, uh, hope you get some diplomatic politicians down there in the next few decades. Canada is dragged along with you, so lead the way. Uh, <laughs> well, um, Drew, I, I think... Uh, Canada might want to just take a pacifist turn because I don't think America is going to be leading anywhere good. Sadly. Uh, yeah. Know. Although if you if you keep electing people like Trudeau, I mean he'll follow along gladly enough. Oh yeah, that guy. God. Or the guy before him, uh, Harper. I mean Harper was. A willing enabler of American incompetence, so. And so is this one. Yeah. Oh. It's a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like the British Prime Ministers, most of them are willing to just allow American leaders to do all kinds of dumb shit and just follow right along. Because, in truth, they're not that much better. I guess maybe the last British Prime Minister to have some level of independence really was Thatcher in that regard. You know? I mean, <clears throat> she's kind of the one that led the way on You Can Talk to Gorbachev, and uh, she did not approve of the uh, Grenada invasion. You know, but uh, pretty much uh, everybody's been a rubber stamp ever since, right? Yes. I mean, Tony Blair's the ultimate example um, of just a guy who, no matter whoever the American president was at the time, he just signed on to whatever they wanted to do. That guy's a tool. Yeah. Absolute uh, tool. I love that, the little Bush cartoon that came out right as Bush was leaving office where Tony Blair is basically his little bitch boy follower. Uh, and they called themselves the Coalition <laughs> of the Willing. Or they created a dance team, Coalition of the Thrilling. Uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Funny. Uh, all right, and then we have one from Ed Gee for $5. Thank you, Ed. He says, hello, fellows. I wanted to know what you think of George Thomas from the Civil War. I mean, I know Sean is a big fan of George Thomas. Uh, apparently, Stephen Davis, not as much, though. Yeah, what's Davis said about him? Well, he just he repeated the thing about how uh, Thomas could be slow. And basically that... He, he talked about Sherman's complaints about Thomas being slow and implied that Sherman was right. Uh, yeah, I mean, George Thomas isn't like, he isn't typically like a fast force marcher, but then again, he did chase Hood pretty hardcore, I'd say, especially considering the weather conditions. Yeah, I think the whole Thomas's slow thing was more just the way that he was, and, you know, in both in appearance and the way that he himself moved. I have never found any evidence that he was particularly slow during the Civil War. Um, you know, uh, yeah, it, it's the best army level, ta army level tactician of the war for sure. It's uh, also interesting you mentioned that he just kind of looked slow because uh, the other guy who gets accused of being slow was another guy who was fairly big, Longstreet. Yeah, I found no evidence that Longstreet was slow either. Um, now I don't. Now, uh, there's not too many instances of Longstreet or Thomas doing lightning-fast marches like Stonewall Jackson. But keeping in mind that Stonewall Jackson, his men were getting pretty run down. 
And it should also be kept in mind that <clears throat> Jackson's marching came from Richard Taylor, who was a brigade commander under him. And Taylor was the one who told Jackson, like, instead of pressing your men that hard, give them a rest. So what Jackson would do is had the men, I think, march, he was there one or two hours, and they would get a 10 minute break, five or 10 minute break. That way he could keep up a punishing pace. You know? Right. Uh, yeah, I've never really found any particular evidence that Thomas or Longstreet were slow. I think they were just kind of ponderous in their actions, and they weren't the kind of guys you could, like, I say you couldn't rush them along. I mean, they... <laughs> How might I say this? They're both independent-minded. Doesn't help, you know? Uh, so, yeah, I think they just, seemed, they just appeared ponderous in appearance and in action, but on the actual battlefield and in uh, operational maneuvers, I see no evidence for it. Or nothing considerable. Uh, but yeah, no, excellent army tactician. Uh, one of the very best of the Civil War. And, um, you know, I, I really wish he'd been able to write his memoirs. In fact, he died at his desk writing a reply to an attack on his generalship at Nashville. Why would you yeah. attack his generalship at Nashville? I mean, he destroyed Hood's army. That's... <laughs> what's the what's the critique? Uh, it was from Schofield, who hated Thomas, and oh. had tried to essentially tried to replace him during the battle. And Schofield did absolutely horrible during Nashville. He was overly cautious. Uh, but, I mean, Schofield's a, Schofield, especially in the Nashville campaign, is a real piece of shit, you know? So... Schofield is just trying to say, like, oh, Thomas was slow. If he had attacked earlier or if he had attacked at this time, it would have been a more bigger victory, you know? Um, I mean, I mentioned Thomas not being able to be rushed. I mean, you know, Grant is telling Thomas, attack him now, attack him now. And Thomas is like, I can't. The cavalry is not ready. And more importantly, the ground is iced over. Like, any attack is just going to be my men getting slaughtered. I'm not doing this until the weather permits, you know? That's what I mean by not being rushed. Now, keep in mind this. Sheridan walked around in the Shenandoah Valley for weeks. No, I'm sorry, months before he finally got into action. He wasn't being sent letters from Grant saying, hurry up. Grant never sent a letter like that to him. And it took Sheridan forever to finally attack. You know? To the point where when he finally did attack, Early thought, I'm dealing with a sluggish Union general. I'll beat him. But, you know, Sheridan... Not a bad general on a battlefield, and he had a lot more men, too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, just stuff like that. But anyway, yeah, Thomas, excellent commander. Unfortunately, not only did he not write his memoirs, because he died too soon, but Rosecrans didn't write his memoirs. Um, a lot of the Army of the Cumberland officers didn't write memoirs for some reason. I think that really hurt them uh, in the battle of historical memory. And it also didn't help that, you know, Buell, while he didn't write his memoirs, wrote a an account of Shiloh that's, I mean, it's it's a decent enough account, but you can tell he really doesn't like Grant. He's just taking shots at him, and it, it gets it gets pretty petty, you know? Um, yeah, God, which Army of the Cumberland officers did write memoirs? I mean, Sheridan wrote, Sheridan wrote his memoirs, and actually he was very complimentary of Thomas and Rosecrans. Um David Stanley, the guy I kind of looked like, wrote his memoirs, uh, great memoirs, very acidic. But off the top of my head, I can't think of it. Oh, well, Richard Johnson wrote some memoirs. They're absolutely awful. If you want to read, like, 18th... I'm sorry, if you want to read 19th century schmaltz, go read that stuff. All right? Huh. Anyway, so... What do we got next, sir? All right, we have Oroz again for $2. Thank you, Oroz. And he says, Have you followed any of Peter Turchin's stuff? Um, I've heard his name referenced in articles people have gone over his ideas <clears throat> I don't know him in particular detail I do think his idea of elite overproduction is pretty dead on um, I know his idea is that you can kind of predict overall historical trends um, I am more open to that idea than most other historians but always with some amount of caution you know, like, like I'm not going to dismiss the Howe and Strauss generational theory out of hand. I think there's some utility there, you know, uh, among other things. So, anyway, what about you? You heard of him? I'm, I've heard the name. I don't really know his ideas, though. 
so I can't really comment on this one too much. Next up. up. I think can I you lost... hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, go ahead. Bryce Henderson, let's go. All right, so Bryce Henderson <laughs> says, Hello, as neoliberalism enters terminal decay, do you think we'll see the rise of extremism or will the center successfully reform? Is this similar to the 1930s where the center must reform or die? Oof, that's a big question. Um, one take I've heard is that the center will simply have to be reconfigured. And <clears throat> you'd preferably want um, a leader who can create a settlement that will include people from both factions, kind of like in the way you sort of see with um, Henry the Seventh after um, Richard the Third is defeated, or the way you also see with the Glorious Revolution settlement. Um, got me another example. I mean, debatably, you know, Julius Caesar and Augustus, right? Yeah. You know, so I mean, perhaps. Uh, what do you think? Um. That's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Um, I see very little evidence right now that the center is interested in reform. That being said, if you look at where people's opinions are versus the political establishment, there's clearly a difference. And I guess it's possible that electorally you see the center shifting just organically. And at that point, it's possible you could see a realignment. Uh, if the center tries to hold on to power, the you know the center that has been in power since approximately 1980, at that point you do see you're going to see significant political strife and extremist actions. Well, to... I'm of the opinion that well, the, the center tries to take extremes from both and integrate them, but. You know, I, 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 um, I don't know. It, it's hard for me to see a way that it's hard for me to see the center being successful, but also hard for me to see a way for them being um, replaced. You know, one thing's for sure. I think Adam Curtis is right about this. That these people want to manage everything, and they don't understand the world as something dynamic. They're trying to freeze things in place. You know, to the uh, end of history phase right yeah and you, know, you mentioned thing about democracy i mean <clears throat> the start in the 1990s in particular when the idea that okay people are actually not rational well that undermines democracy completely you know so keep that in mind about the center these are not democratic people they want a managed oiled machine you know that will give them the inputs that they want or well, the outputs i guess you know right <clears throat> Uh, but yeah, there's there's thing about 1930s America though too is you had more countervailing forces. I mean, even as it fails economically, diplomatically, that Washington consensus that's been around since the 1980s persists, doesn't it? Like nothing stops that. <laughs> uh, maybe if you get like an Andrew Jackson-like figure who uh, wants to come in and just we'll wipe everything away, right? Yeah, I think that's kind of what Trump positioned himself as because of Bannon's advice. But, of course, Trump was not that guy. You think he'd be that guy if he gets elected in 2024? No. <laughs> I mean, well, Trump has no real ideas. Because he... he no, I of, meant, like... He, I get afraid that he might because he wants revenge. Well, he yeah. sort of positioned himself as the guy who drained the swamp and, you know, changed everything up throughout the establishment and all that. But he didn't. He had four years. He did nothing of the sort. And not only that, but after railing against Jeb Bush in the primary for his brother's war record, he then puts John Bolton in the cabinet. Yeah, that should have been a dead giveaway, right? I mean, a lot of it also is that, you know, when something goes wrong, Trump's first instinct is to throw somebody under the bus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think for that reason, he'll never be pulled off. I only mention it because, you know, part of me thinks that if he gets elected in 2024, like, you know, this time it's revenge. 
like the Jaws the Revenge tagline. So, uh, but yeah, I don't think he can really. I mean, I I, I sincerely d- I, I doubt that he can help himself. You know, he'll just take whoever it is and toss him under the bus. You know, unlike someone like Andrew Jackson, who, what can we say? You know, okay, Jackson could combative guy. He definitely made enemies, right? But he also had lifelong friends and allies. Yeah, true. You know? and he never people... took Martin Van Buren and threw him under the bus, right? Yeah, he was capable of maintaining a friendship with his VP. Uh, something you cannot say about Trump. <clears throat> or Joe Biden. <laughs> yeah. Or Barack Obama. Wow. A lot of presidential VP tension lately, huh? Yeah, also, I don't think uh, Bill and Al Gore got along that well. And, of course, the Bush and Cheney relationship also broke down. Uh, Bush and Quayle didn't really get along. Uh, Reagan and Bush, they had differences, but ultimately they worked well enough together. Um, well, I think that was helped along by the fact that Reagan came to need Bush. Yeah. So that oh, sort of gave Bush worked. a role to play. It also helped that Reagan was always like, look, everybody's got to be happy. Everybody's got to have some, you know, within this Republican Party, everybody has to have something going on for them, right? He was always good about that. Um, also, the, the Obama-Biden one was it was there, but it was kept so low-key, people didn't even really know about it, in some cases, until after the presidency. Yeah, because remember there were little, there's that fanfic novel I saw for sale at Barnes & Noble where uh, they had just left office and now they're, you know, traveling around the country solving mysteries or some bullshit as if the the romance is still alive and well I mean that myth was kept alive for a while but mostly just by people who wanted it to be the case yeah basically you know, just your party hacks who think that the democratic party is without flaw alright alright um, right, next one we have one that claims to be the last one, but now is not. Uh, Drew Penner, $5 Canadian, says, Last one, since I know you guys are probably tired. If you had to recommend an author on naval tactics or strategy, what's your recommendation? Oh. Um, of course, Mahan's always interesting to read, or at least read about what he was saying and how it influenced things. Uh, Polymer, Norman Polymer. Uh, wrote a lot of books during the Cold War about naval strategy that I thought were really good. Um, you know, it, a lot of it also being a critique of Mahan, but also getting into, like, you know, with Fleet and Bean and, you know, what, what's the role of a small navy, that kind of stuff. So, you know, that's just, I mean, a lot of stuff with that I, I kind of mostly pick up just from just reading uh, about reading history books as opposed to just reading, like, a theoretical book, I guess you'd say. Right. You know, um, you know. But anyway, you know, Norman Palmer is good, and of course, you want to look at uh, look at Mahan, for sure. I'm trying to think of a good ancient naval book. Um, Krista Steinbe wrote a book, Rome versus Carthage, which focuses on the naval elements of the First Punic War. That's a good book. Um, another one that focuses on the Athenian fleet. Uh, it's mostly about the financing, so it's it's not it's definitely not a casual read. But Vincent Gabrielson wrote a book in 1994 about the financing of the Athenian fleet. And if you think about it, you're talking about a pre-modern state without uh, the ability to print its own currency or anything like that, without the ability to deficit spend, and it was able to maintain a large fleet. So how did they do that? Well. The Gabrielson book goes into that in great detail. And I think in many ways it tells you a lot about what was possible in an ancient society if people really were determined to make it happen. Uh, so you talk about how you... Uh, basically it relies upon rich people making large contributions on a frequent basis. And it talks also about, in the 5th century, the contributions of the empire, where the Athenians were extracting tribute. Um so to me that would be my go-to naval book uh, in terms of things that talk about the Athenian fleet's tactics and sort of the I guess fun stuff there's actually not a very good one at least not a not like one I would think of as being a, a standout 
I'm pulling up one right now that I'm a fan of. Um, Kaigun, Strategy, Tactics, and Technology in the Imperial Japanese Navy by David C. Evans and Mark R. Petty. That is one of the best books you can read. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Um, they also did a follow-up book, or at least Petty did, um, called Sunburst, The Rise of Japanese Naval Air Power, although that's not exactly what you're looking for. And there's one, I'm going to look up the name of the book right now, but there's one that's about U.S. naval planning in the interwar period. And just, just reading those, yeah, pl War Plan Orange, The U.S. Strategy to Defeat Japan, 1897 to 1945. That's by Edward S. Miller. That is also an excellent book, too. You know, so, and just reading those will give you a great idea of, like, like the type of strategy the strategies that are being um, uh, the type of strategic thing that was happening before the war and how it influences the war itself and also like in a lot of ways especially with the case of uh, War Plan Orange um, how a lot of the work on that does pave the way for US victory because that's what good things with the US Navy in the interwar period they're doing a lot of very effective training and naval exercises they called them fleet problems yeah. Uh, we have another one now from Ed Gee for five dollars, and he wants to know: Were Glory and Lincoln accurate movies, and did black troops help to beat the Confederacy? Uh, uh, the answer for the black troops: Yes, most certainly. Now, the majority of USCT regiments—that's what they're called because they stand for United States Colored Troops—and you had other ones that had other names too, like Corps d'Afrique. Native Guards, those are Louisiana units, but eventually all units are known as USCT. Well, just about all. Except for like 54th and 55th Massachusetts, and I think, I want to say the 5th Massachusetts Cal uh, Cavalry. Uh, most units did not see battle. They mostly did garrison work. Uh, the one Union regiment in the Civil War that had the highest death rate was actually a USCT regiment stationed in Missouri. They saw no combat. They were mostly used in working in swamps in hard conditions with bad officers so they suffered appalling death rate uh, so keep that in mind most of they're doing is garrison work that frees up white regiments and others to go fight however of course starting in 1863 you see them in more battles port hudson battery wagner and you know by the end of the civil war you have the 25th corps which is a corps only made up with usct and they're the ones that occupy richmond so yes, very important. Oh, I did not know that. Warrior. That's uh, that's actually pretty funny, considering that people who had been big supporters of the Confederate government were now occupied by black troops. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> like it, well, it could have gotten even weir hey, It could have gotten even weirder. I mean, yeah. remember right before the Civil War ends, the Confederate Congress narrowly passed an Emancipation Bill where slaves could be freed for military service. Right. So. Yeah. They were training a Confederate, black Confederate regiment in the closing weeks of the war. So if they had waited, it could have gotten really weird over there. <laughs> yeah. So the uh, you know the newly conscripted black Confederates fighting the Twenty Fifth Corps. Yeah. <laughs> it could have gotten really weird. Uh, yeah, but you know uh, the one thing to keep in mind too is they generally black troops didn't see a lot of combat, and this is not really their fault. A lot of times they were quite anxious for it. And in most most occasions, they did perfectly well. Uh, but I say most, please keep this in mind. And, well, me and this other Civil War story made fun of this narrative that you run into a lot, where um, the black soldiers fight in a battle, and whether or not they do good or bad, the white soldiers are really impressed by them. And that is not always the case. There are numerous engagements where white soldiers, like, either were, were completely unimpressed with them either in a failed attack or even a successful attack. Like, at Petersburg, they, uh, the black soldiers overran some entrenchments on June 15th, and a lot of Union soldiers said, whatever, they outnumbered them. Yeah. Or, God, it gets even worse. You know what happened to the Battle of the Crater, right? Like, and they blew up a hole in the lines, and they... I've actually been reading about it lately. They blew up the hole in the lines, and they, they charged the soldiers in. There's accounts of white soldiers killing black soldiers in the crater like white union soldiers killing their fellow black soldiers because they wanted to, because the confederates are closing in and they wanted to show the confederates they're like race solidarity essentially like like you know like like you know like like look i'm killing this black guy don't kill me like horrible i'm not saying that happened a whole bunch in there but we do have accounts of that i mean the battle of the crater that's one of the most horrific 
battles the entire conflict, you know. So, um, but at the end, but on some total, the black soldiers did very, very well. Although sometimes they had bad officers, that actually happened a little too often, because a lot of soldiers who normally wouldn't get promoted to officer would serve at black regiments. And straight up, if you're an officer in a black regiment, the other regimental officers look down on you, because to their mind, you're commanding garrison troops. You know. Uh, anyway, complicated answer. You know, doing a whole stream in the USCT could be really good sometime. Yeah, yeah it's sure. an interesting topic. And for some reason, I I do a, I write I write and study a lot a lot of Civil War battles that involve black soldiers. You know, so I've been I've been accumulating a lot of uh, information over the years. But anyway, uh, accurate. Uh, yeah, you know, Glory's pretty good, although they're attacking in the wrong direction. You know, so when they're attacking in Glory. The uh, their, the ocean I want to say is to the um, left of them when it should be to the right of them when they attack. <laughs> also, um, they just put them more on the beach for dramatic effect. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, it's a, it's a small quibble. Um, I mean, there's there's a few things in Glory that are off. Like for instance, they kind of picked the 54th Massachusetts as being made up of a lot of runaway slaves. It wasn't. It's was mostly free black men in Massachusetts. Although there most certainly were runaways and ex-slaves in the unit. That wasn't the majority of them. Um, also, while they did penetrate the Confederate defenses, they probably didn't get as far as they show in the movie. You know? Uh, but these are kind of relatively minor things. Glory's an excellent film overall. It's worth it. Um, Lincoln's very good. Like, really good. Uh, superbly acted excellent writing um, how accurate is the 13th amendment passage uh, I'd say pretty good I'd have to I'd, I'd probably have to read more about how the passage went one thing that is overstated is they have James Spader playing like this like southern political operative who's bribing people um, he probably wasn't nearly as successful as the movie shows um but yeah, you know, the acting in the movie is just is superb, I think. Lincoln's a really good movie. Um, uh, of course, you know, people have questions about it today. I had questions then because there's barely any black characters. But then again, there are no black congressmen, right? Uh, and so some people saw it as like, oh, you know, like a white savior movie, which I can see their point, I guess. Uh, another one, too, is... Um, the uh, the way the Confederates are portrayed in the movie is with a amount of sympathy that I don't think they would allow in a film today. You know, hmm. which I I want to say that too. I, I was um, comically enough I was hanging out with this guy at one of the bars afterwards, and I slept on his couch. And apparently, this dude like puts on Ken Burns' Civil War to go to sleep to. <laughs> really. Well, it, it's kind of soothing. Everybody talks in even tone. You got the music, and I didn't even know that guy. Was, that, this guy's like a Civil War actor, so when he's meeting me. He's like, "Oh, cool, right?" So anyway, uh, you know, I just kind of like watching it before falling asleep, and I was like, "Oh, that's right. I forgot." Ken Burns' Civil War. The narrative obviously wants the North to win, and says the North is right, but it doesn't want to gloat over the Confederates getting destroyed. Especially in the last few episodes, as the Confederacy's collapsing and their economy's being ripped to pieces, and the men or soldiers are starving, you know, uh, there's a lack of gloating in it that is, um, how should I say, classy, at the least, yeah. at the minimum. Yeah, my favorite also, part of uh, the Ken Burns documentary is still that uh, you know Shelby Foot basically became a sex symbol for women in the South just by telling Civil War <laughs> stories. Uh, you know, you say that, man. Like, I knew, um, I, uh, I knew somebody I went to college with. She thought he was hot. <laughs> like, 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 she was the equivalent of, like, she was like, look, if I got a fucking old guy, it's going to be either Sean Connery or Shelby Foote. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I, I'm, I wonder if before that, it'd be funny if, say, Shelby Foote, you know, never thought of himself as being a ladies' man and, you know, maybe his wife was like, yeah, you, you never leave me because you could never get anybody else. And then after that documentary, he starts getting panties in the mail. Oh, yeah? No, apparently uh, Shelby Foote was a ladies' man. Oh, okay, never mind. 
So <laughs> I, I think it'd be funnier though if like he went his whole life and you know, he was a fairly straight laced guy who was only with one woman, and then after, he goes in this documentary, and all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's Shelby Foot sex symbol <laughs> out of nowhere. Hey, you should. He got court martialed during World War Two. Really? Yeah, like he ran off with a British woman in a jeep or something. You gotta look it up, man. No, 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 no. Show, show, show me foot was a ladies' man. <laughs> All right, well, who <laughs> was kind of wild, you know? Uh, somebody had a quick follow up. Uh, is Shelby Foot a lost causer? No. Okay. No. Uh, what I would say of Shelby Foot is he reminds me of. Um, People like there, there's this whole generation of, of southern authors like him, William Faulkner, Walker Percy, uh, Robert Penn Warren, who actually wrote a really good book about Jefferson Davis. A little short, but very good book because he was he was really interested. He was really interested in Jefferson Davis, and these were all writers who, to them, the Confederacy was this unique southern experience that they found to be a deep well of. Uh, of pathos and conflicted feelings and generally speaking these men did not like segregation okay but if you had asked them to damn their confederate ancestors they would have told you to go to hell that was their overall demeanor um i was talking to my years ago and she mentioned about her grandfather because she was like yeah my grandfather like you know he he voted for desegregation candidates. She's like, but I don't get it. He'd still be praising Confederates. And I'm like, well, you know, I mean, for him, it was two separate things. You know, his ancestors fought in a war, got blown to pieces, in a war that destroyed the economy and humiliated the South. Which, once again, anybody who tells me that the South lost the war and won the peace is a goddamn moron. You know, doesn't understand economics. Oh, what do you know? It sounds like the contemporary left. Anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I think my grandpa you know, was sort of in that camp. Uh, he... Yeah. He was always the kind of guy who, I think mostly he was a labor guy. I don't, his stance on race changed over time. He was one of the few people who, because he voted for Obama, became way less racist. Because I know at one point people thought uh, that would never happen, but he he really just stopped saying racist shit after he voted for Obama in 08. Uh, he was the one person that worked for. Um, and then my grandma, <laughs> on the other side of the family, she was the one person who was fooled by Sarah Palin. She had been a Hillary supporter, and she decided to go for McCain because of Sarah Palin. So that tactic that like one no one else got my grandma. <coughs> yeah, yeah, I, and I don't, um, you know, we could. Um, I don't think Shelby Foote was like a true loss causer. You know, um, yeah, I, you know. Um, I think he had some of the ticks of the lost cause, you know. But honestly, the parts of what would be considered standard lost cause interpretation that Shelby Foote did put forth, such as the North won because it had more resources and Robert E. Lee was a really good general, those actually are, can stand up under scrutiny. Yeah. You know? And now, yeah, you know, like, like those are arguments that, you know, that those are things I agree. Well, I don't think really was great. I think he was very good, but... You know, the whole North winning because of superior resources. Uh, yeah, that's the main reason yeah. they won. I mean, that's how most wars go, actually. Yeah. No, this whole attempt lately to, like, make it to where, no, the, actually the South had the advantage. I'm like, man, you guys are idiots. You just well, don't. You don't you, you know, the North can't just win and be righteous. No, they got to be underdogs, too. What are you, a moron? Well, part of it, I, I've noticed, especially with uh, dealing with some grad students, especially post, like, 2015 or so, if they don't know anything about military, the military aspect of the Civil War, they find it offensive the idea that someone like Lee could be a good general because they assume, oh, well, you're defending him, you must be racist. It's like, no, I'm talking about moving X's and O's on a map. I'm not talking about moral character or the cause. We're talking about strictly military science. Uh, just it's kind of like uh, if you were to tell them so uh, some uh, Nazi general was talented, they say, "Oh, well, you must have some sympathy for the cause." No, these are two very separate conversations. Yeah, and in the case, I mean, you know, like with Lee, there's more moral ambiguity there than you're gonna find with Guderian. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, but Guderian's a great general. <laughs> 
No, I mean, it, it's, I don't know, I feel like it, it's, it's difficult to have conversation with people who can't distinguish between morality and, say, performance. Um, people have a lot of problems with that right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's... Shit, like Wilt Chamberlain, I think even in sports, Wilt Chamberlain's place in the NBA gets downplayed because he was seen as something of an asshole and a bit of a degenerate. But, I mean, that guy was dominant. Yeah, Yeah, well, actually, they kind of did that recently because Bill Russell died, and they were showing, like, a comparison between Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain. And, you know, this whole, like, documentary was just on the background of the bar, and they were... um, yeah, they were like, oh, Bill Russell, like, you know, he was great for, like, civil rights and things. And look, he's better than Wilt Chamberlain, essentially. Like, they show, like, a stack up between the two. And I'm like, and I actually was thinking about what you said about that, where they try to downplay Wilt Chamberlain. And, you know, uh, and I'm just like, come on, man. He was in Conan the Destroyer. All right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I, th- I want to add this, though. I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of movies nowadays have crap villains. Because the villains aren't just bad, they're also, like, incompetent and not very scary and weak, you know? And yeah. I'm like, man, I mean, you know, like, like, yeah, yeah, Darth Vader's not supposed to be a good guy, but I'm also supposed to be fucking scared of him, right? Right. You know, if he's just bumbling around like Kylo Ren, I'm gonna be like, this guy's a joke, you know? Yeah, especially I'm, when he throws a little hissy fit at the after we first meet him. I'm like, okay, so this is, this is just a, a Vader cosplayer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> In the movie, I mean, like, they could have played that up where he's a Vader cosplayer and doesn't seem interested in with it, but the writers are just, the writers and the, the creative team behind the movie is just too, too, they don't, they don't have the skill for that kind of thing, you know? I'm not even sure George Lucas would have had the skill for that kind of thing. Actually, I know he wouldn't have had the skill for that kind of thing. You know, it's, uh, yeah, I just, you know, I, I mean, another example, like Noah Cross in Chinatown, you know, uh, as a horrible, evil person, one of, the, one of the most evil men put to screen, you know? But he's not outwardly evil. You know, he figure it out later on. He knows how to be charming. He's obviously an excellent businessman. Or, uh, you know, a more contemporary example from Breaking Bad, uh, Gustavo Fring. The guy who runs the meth operation, who, on the surface, just seems like a pretty nice guy who runs a chicken restaurant. And yeah, donates to the good... police department. You know, though, to be fair, though, uh, you know, Breaking Bad, um, you know, it's not like my favorite show, but... Uh, that is uh, that show I mean yeah, like I said it's, it's a good show I saw it like eight or nine years ago but it seems like now I think about it it seems even better than when I saw it since things have gotten so much dumber since then you know uh, but that's a great example you brought up you know Breaking Bad's a really good one um, yeah so yeah it's ridiculous stuff man you know yeah I mean uh, uh, Gustavo I think in many ways he I don't think he's my favorite character, but I think he arguably is the best character. Just because if you think about it, how do you how do you run a drug empire without being detected? And also sort of work with the cartel, but also kind of go your own way, balance out all the different competitors. I mean, I think you'd have to have a persona like his. I think yeah. he, no, they, he, he's, they pulled that off. Yeah, he's perfect for that role. I mean... Um, and also, I like how even when he's murdering people, he's always extremely mannerly, neat. Uh, he's a neat freak. Uh, he never yeah. breaks character. And he's always the same kind of uptight, manager-like person, but at the same time, completely evil. <laughs> Where in a way that in a way that most people would not see it unless they knew. So uh, his employees think, "Oh, he's a nice but strict boss," and. He's a pretty good guy. He's always understanding when I call him. Uh, so it's just uh, the, that that part of the show is brilliant. Uh, oh God, man! I was thinking about that too. I saw a movie today. It had a shoot to kill. You ever saw that? I uh, might have. It sounds familiar. It's a, a kind of '80s action movie, except a lot of it takes place in the woods. Uh, it was like Sidney Poitier was in it. It was like his first movie in like 11 years. Interesting movie to come back on, you know. Uh, but I was watching it. It's 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 not a great movie, but it's a solid movie. But yeah, the villain in that one, I mean, they do a good job making him, especially in the first part of the movie, that's a menacing guy, you know. Uh, so, any who's. What we got next? That is it. Oh, um, there was one more from Drew Penner uh, for 20 Canadian. He says... 
for staying up late. Well, thank you, Drew. And uh, yeah, it has been a long day. I got up at eight, and I got to get up at eight tomorrow too because of orientation. Although I plan on just logging in and then going back to sleep. To be perfectly honest with you guys, just don't tell anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Because this, this part will be online, and there's just not that much that's going to be useful about it. So I'm just going to log in and uh, take a nap. I do want to throw uh, I do want to throw this to uh, Marty Moose that, uh, yes, Clarence Bodiger from RoboCop is amazing. Um, yes. And I know some people are mentioning the Shelby Foote thing. I, my personal theory on the attack on Shelby Foote is that he sold more books and is more charismatic than just about every Civil War historian who's ever lived. It's, it's also funny, uh, the biggest fan I've ever met of Shelby Foote is actually a black dude I uh, knew in grad <laughs> school who talked yeah. about, you know, my. he said his goal doing history is to become a storyteller like Shelby Foote. So. And I would say this from a purely historical critique of Shelby Foote, uh, yes, there are problems. There are things I would disagree with him on. But he is an excellent writer and he is very perceptive about personality and the interplay between people in the Civil War you know uh, if I was to criticize him on anything I think he might have been a little too hung up on Nathan Bedford Forrest you know I think he might have fallen for some of the myth there you know because to me Forrest is just like a, just a guy with an awful awful temper you know um which means he's superb in an individual fight, but he can't work with anybody because he's, he's just got a nasty temper, you know, temper. Uh, but, you know, that would be... That would be uh, something I would, uh, like, you know, contest with Foot. But, you know, ultimately going after him, it's it's really, it's, it's really just... It's a form of jealousy, I think. But also, for those kinds of people you can't have any kind of sympathy for the fact that the South gets blown apart in a war. I mean, you could say it's a war of choice, and it is. They were idiots. That's why it's, that's why it's tragic. But, you know, I, got, I forgot who it was. I think it was a guy, uh, I think it was I.F. Stone. There's, they were talking, he said that, uh, they were talking about some interpretation, because I, I, he was a journalist who wrote some historical novels, and I think he was talking about his interpretation of uh, Thomas Jefferson, and somebody brought this stuff up about him, because you know, the thing with Jefferson owning slaves, and then you know, all men are created equal. And he said, "Well, you know, history is tragedy, not melodrama." And I follow that pretty closely, you know. And if you view it as tragedy, you'll at least be a lot more sympathetic towards people instead of um, trying to find heroes and villains under every rock. Yeah, and I think too, people forget that uh, when you're, if you're trying to judge the morality of someone from the past. You, especially in terms of their racial views, you cannot judge them by modern standards. That otherwise, you basically just end up with a history that reads everyone was a villain. The end. Yeah. Uh, which is why, which is why sometimes I, that's part of why I'm critical of the people, especially the YouTube history community, when they just dunk on Wilson nonstop. Because I mean, yeah, Wilson clearly made some mistakes and he had his problems. But to pretend like he's one of the worst presidents ever just because he was a virulent racist, we got to remember, uh, yeah, you know, most people in his period shared that view. He was not unique. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, like, I mean, I've never really been a big Wilson fan to begin with for a lot of reasons, you know. I'm, I'm, and I, I, I mean. You know, it's always a tricky thing because at the same time I'm supposed to be like, oh, you know, come on, Genghis Khan's fine. But then again, I'm also like, what rule at the time doesn't do crazy violent shit? It's just what rulers do. I don't know. No, I also, yeah, like Geng the difference between Genghis Khan and his contemporaries is Genghis Khan was more successful. That's really what it boils down to. Um, that yeah, that's what and I think too, man. That's what I think too. Julius Caesar, I, the Christian Meyer book on him, which I think is generally good, the thesis is a little bit goofy because he says that he, uh, uh, Caesar was just uniquely antisocial personality who is willing to put himself before the Republic. So how does that make him different from anyone else at the time? He just was better at it. That's the difference. They all wanted to do that. Most of them just couldn't. Yeah, I mean, there might be a few exceptions of the ones who don't. But yeah, generally speaking, that's what these guys want to do. Uh, it's 
you're getting into a lot of tricky stuff. But, you know, I, I, I think one thing to keep in mind is I think that in the 1600s and 1700s, at least in the West, there was a great shift in morality that occurred. And a big part of that is going to be Quakerism and the rise of the anti-slavery movement. Uh, Isaiah Berlin would also say Romanticism. Because Isaiah Berlin would say that before that, you wouldn't say, and we should, I, I, I kind of agree with him on it. I, I could see it in like medieval Christian writing. You wouldn't say like, oh, Saladin was a great general. You'd be like, no, he's, he's a, I mean, yeah, he's a good general, but man, is he just he's an evil Muslim type of thing, right? And he said for Romanticism, you started to get more relativism and the more of the idea of like, you know, uh, a good man at a tragic cause, which is what essentially Robert E. Lee is cast as in Ken Burns' Civil War. You know, good man in a tragic, stupid cause, right? Yeah. You know? Uh, that's very romantic. And I really feel like we're getting out of that. <laughs> and I've always liked romanticism, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, uh, I think that's enough for one night. I'm pretty tired. And, uh, yeah, we went, uh, we went a lot longer than I thought. We got a lot of Super Chats. Thank you, everybody. Did. Thank you very much. Tours are awful here right now. Uh, it's, it's, it's rough, so thank you all very, very much. Yeah, I'm glad I decided to invest the 30-something dollars to get the more high-speed internet here. Uh, it was for the month, so I figured it would be worth it, and I figured I'd make it back with Super Chats, so... Yeah, awesome. Uh, because, yeah, they, this is one of those hotels where they do the thing where you can get internet for free or included, but it's going to be shit unless you pony up a little extra money. Dickheads. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so I guess the $31 or whatever it was that I spent was worth it. So thank you all for coming I out. I do want to ask... Uh, before going, do you have any ideas on what you want to do next? Um, I don't for next do a, week. You want, to do a, you want to do a sequel to this? I can. Uh, we can. Uh, we can rank the uh, fleet carrier classes of World War II. Yeah, we can do that. And let's do a tier ranking, man. Because yeah, right. we already we already been talking about it. We're already on topic, right? Yeah, just uh, you have to send me some uh, material on what all the classes are to put on there. Go list. All right, I will. Um, I will send you a. Uh, I'll send you a list. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right, All right everybody. Y'all have a good night. All Great right. to be here. Good night, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next Monday. I might have a video before then. I guess we'll find out. So, everybody, take care and peace out. All right, we're off.